Almost. Yeah, we're oh. just a few seconds away. We're live now, Chair. We're live now? Okay, thank yes. you. So welcome everybody to the Heritage Grimsby Advisory Committee meeting of Tuesday, November the 23rd. Uh, first on the agenda, I have the call to order. Next, I have the land acknowledgement, and this is the first time we'll be reading this. Um, as council has, current, has recently uh, instituted the land acknowledgement, we're going to be doing that for the Heritage Committee as well. And I'd like to read that the town of Grimsby is situated on treaty land. This land is steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Hadawendaronk, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Miss Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. There are many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The town of Grimsby stands with all Indigenous people, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. Is there any disclosures of interest? Seeing none, I'm going to move to the approval of the agenda. I think I need a mover and a seconder for that. And Sarah. All in favor? Carried. I'm going to move to the first item, which is delegations. Uh, our first uh, delegates are with respect to the Wolverton uh, development on 19 Elm and 13 Mountain Road. I'd like to welcome, I'm not too sure, make sure I get everybody who's on the screen and please forgive me if I miss someone. Um, do we have Philip Evans, Emily Collins, Elsa Fincello, Jasmine Froelich, and Harley Valentine? And I'll let you folks take it over. Thanks, thanks so much, um, everyone, for giving us the opportunity to chat tonight. Um, uh, I can um, just jump into our, our presentation. Uh, uh, again, thank you for, for making the time. Um, I believe the town has access to our slide deck and wondered if um, you'd be so kind as to um, uh, operate that while I, while I read through my notes here and uh, try and answer the questions for folks. Thank you, Bianca. Did you send that over to me? Because I can pull that up. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, Emily, I wonder if you could send that over. Yep. I could also share my screen too, if that's helpful. Maybe maybe that's easier, Em. Um, yeah, I'm, sure. I'm joined uh, with by um, not just the uh, uh, the applicant team um, today, uh, Elsa and Harley and Jasmine, um, but I'm also joined by Emily from from our office at ERA. Um, so we'll we'll try and run through under the 10 minute time slot and uh, appreciate everybody's uh, comments. And I'll I'll go through the slide deck and uh, and then take questions afterwards. So. Um, uh, just, just, for, just so everyone is aware, uh, tonight is actually the, the first time we, we had appeared in front of this group uh, back in September, but tonight will be our first opportunity to present the, the, the project to you and uh, in, in the application. Um, and I just, uh, I will take an opportunity to introduce ourselves, provide an overview of the, the, uh, the process, our involvement with, uh, and provide the committee with an understanding of what uh, is involved and what's being proposed as a conservation approach and um, mitigation strategies that that go alongside it uh, in, in the interest of the heritage resources. Uh, I hope this is clear um, around the heritage matters. Uh, and we, we're aware that there's a wide range of planning considerations, um, but today we, we'd like to focus on the Enforce Heritage Planning Framework uh, and heritage protections and what an appropriate conservation strategy uh, would be for the, height, the, the site's heritage resources. Uh, so to do this, um, we'll give a sense of the surrounding context and we'll move into the proposed uh, development from there. Uh, we'll provide a conclusion on the impacts in the, of the proposed development and um, any adjacent uh, in nearby res heritage resources, which we heard from the last uh, session as well. And what we're hoping tonight is, is to get um, uh, the committee's overall feedback on the proposed development as it relates to 
uh, the cultural heritage values of the site and and those adjacent resources. So don't don't feel limited by uh, by by anything with with respect to those comments. So uh, just who we are. Uh, so so Emily and I are with ERA. The practice has been around uh, since 1990. We we are a uh, an architecture firm uh, that specializes in uh, heritage planning and adaptive reuse. It's a multidisciplinary firm. We have planners, architects, conservators, writers, uh, designers at, at various capacities. And our, our core interest is actually about uh, connecting to a larger uh, and, and wider consideration for heritage uh, as it relates to urban design, city, city building, and a larger set of, of cultural values that uh, is continually evolving. Um, and we hope to provide a perspective of our work at, at various scales. Um, our knowledge uh, uh, beyond what it is as it practices in, in uh, cities across the country um, is, is, is not limited to urban areas. We, we are very much interested in uh, historic communities at every scale uh, in towns um, that, that are evolving and experience forms of growth and managing that, that growth as well. So just for um, purposes of background, um, so everyone's aware, we, we had submitted a heritage impact assessment back in, in May, uh, and that was for the OPA and, and ZBA application. Uh, the town had uh, that um, HIA reviewed, peer reviewed uh, by, by Lee Wallace, and, and the terms of that, uh, in terms of reference for the HIA was, was in fact prepared by uh, the town of Grimsby uh, for this specific site application. Uh, staff had had uh, reported to uh, this committee back in September and outlined uh, a, a number of recommendations for additional information um, to be provided in a revised HIA. <clears throat> we had submitted a revised HIA uh, in October in accordance with those those recommendations. And the town has reviewed that that HIA and um, agree with the, it, their findings and the proposed conservation scope. So staff have also determined um, that the revisions uh, sufficiently respond to the peer reviews comments and um, the comments that they uh, had provided sub, uh, previously, uh, including an evaluation of the carriage house. I know that was a comment that came up um, the last time from this committee, so thank you for that. Um, in terms of where we are today, um, as you know, this is the second time we're meeting uh, with, this, with this group. Uh, and the objective is to focus on the proposal in light of, of staff's comments and recommendations. If um, staff rep recommendations are adopted today, this would mean the continuation of working with the proponent and their, their design team with town staff. And uh, this will continue to refine the design and, and provide further detail in the conservation scope that's being proposed through a site plan application process. So we're at the beginning of a process here, not, not, not the end, just for everyone's um, information. So the site, um, which many of you may be familiar with, um, contains two listed heritage uh, properties on the town's registry, 19 Elm and 13 Mountain Street. So, so 19 Elm is the, uh, we refer to as the church building, it's the Grimsby Baptist Church. <clears throat> uh, and it's now serving currently as a, as a community space. It's, it's a brick building um, of a single story with uh, double heighted vaulted space. Um, the front portion, uh, and then the later uh, addition as a Sunday school uh, is a two story addition. Um, and there is, an, a, there is a vestibule that had been added on the south elevation uh, at, at, uh, in, its, in its history. Um, 13 Mountain, which we'll refer to as the Wolverton House, um, built by uh, Dr. Wolverton. It's now the H&R block offices, um, and it has a second floor uh, residential unit. It's, it's a two-story uh, house form building, um, and it has a small original rear uh, brick addition uh, of a, of a uh, and a series of later additions, including a uh, one and two story um, uh, sunroom on the south elevation. Um, there is a one and a half story uh, former coach house, which has been modified quite a bit on the interior and the exterior. We'll speak about that a little bit more, but it's it's located at the rear of the properties. And I think it's clear to everybody that, that this fronts on to, to Mountain uh, and Elm, but um, uh, much of the surface area is is currently uh, parking lot and um, located along the north and the east portions of of the property. 
So just um, some larger uh, planning context for, for all of us. Um, the site is primarily surrounded by low, low rise residential and commercial buildings. Um, it's not too far from, from Main Street um, and it's, it's located on two regional roads, Mountain and Elm are both regional roads. Um, the site was identified for intensification in the town's official plan. Um, and that plan growth was um, uh, probably quite strategically um, thought through in its, um, what it was to maintain the character of the historic uh, Main Street, not, not far away. So behind, behind that Main Street context. Um, in terms of the surrounding streetscape, um, again, I mentioned it's, it's primarily low rise house form buildings, which have been adapted for institutional uh, uses uh, in some cases. Um, many of the house form buildings are, are medical and professional offices. So um, the block of, of Mountain Street and, and the site, uh, it doesn't follow the same kind of fine grain uh, regular lot pattern that many of the other streets um, uh, do. Uh, and instead it's it's characterized by sort of larger institutional uh, sites. Um, and um, we note that the, the, the Main Street corridor <clears throat> is, is actually a very important historical and visual uh, relationship to the escarpment. And that, that came up at our last session as, as well. Um, it's, uh, and, and, you know, to that, um, uh, the site is is designated under um, as an urban area in the Niagara Escarpment Plan, um, and that uh, had actually been the subject for uh, visual impact assessment by um, Seraphrin uh, Design Group. Uh, they had prepared that that report back in May, and uh, they found actually six relevant viewpoints um, as it relates to uh, views towards the escarpment. Um, you know the Bruce Trail, Public Roads, and and Parkland areas, and they the findings of their report, and we've just taken an excerpt from it um, that uh, they were accepted by the Negra Escarpment Commission. This was something that I think there were a lot of questions about last last session. We wanted to bring this this material forward just to make sure um, everyone's aware that that all parties have been uh, certainly at the table and involved. Uh, in, in consideration of this, um, the proposed development. And they, they, they determined that there would not be any detrimental effect on the scenic resources uh, of, the, of the escarpment. Um, so at the last session, there was um, some really good uh, discussion around um, what the adjacent and nearby heritage properties were. There was, um, some question about what is considered adjacent versus what is what is nearby, and so what we what we did here was just flag um, actually what is considered actually adjacent. The, the, the town doesn't actually have a definition of adjacent, so we we actually just use the provincial policy statement, um, which defines adjacent as sharing a continuous uh, property property line, and so that property uh, is Eleven Mountain Street, the the funeral home there. So that that does uh, share an adjacency. Uh, but there are other properties close by. Um, there's a designated property kitty corner uh, to us uh, at 16 Mountain, and there are four listed properties, um, two fronting onto Mountain Street and two fronting onto to Main Street that are that are close and in proximity to the site. Um, the the you'll notice there's a bit of an irregular shape to the to the block, and the relationship of those rear lot lines with um, Balsam Lane also creates some distance to to Main Street uh, and the character. Um, of those main street buildings. So that's something to just sort of note and be aware of as well. So um, the, the proposal, I think today, what, we, what we'll do is we'll, we'll talk about it in these sort of three key uh, parts. Um, the first is about uh, retaining in situ uh, the heritage resources, the Wolverton House um, and, and the church. So this has been a real concerted effort to do this as a three-dimensional form and not as um, facades. Um, this, this approach is um, uh, very much in line with uh, standards and guidelines, the sort of federal uh, guidance, guidelines that we all sort of speak to and use uh, across the country. Um, but it's rather than, um, you know, just reading the, the kind of elevations of those buildings, what this achieves for passive buyers is, is actually a real engagement and you know, consideration of a setting for these buildings as well. And that brings me to my second point around um, a proposed public plaza uh, between both of the heritage buildings. And what this does, it helps to animate 
not only the street, um, but also the site and engagement with those retained uh, buildings. And then the third element is obviously the, the, um, the new building, the seven story mid rise building that's being proposed, um, which is set back behind those heritage buildings. And this, this ensures uh, visual prominence of the buildings um, and is distinct from the new uh, construction. So just kind of breaking it down into kind of component pieces. Um, first, I'll speak to the removal. And on the last slide, we, we, um, we talked about the buildings that would be retained. This focuses on the buildings that will be uh, removed, um, which will allow the focus and reuse of those original, uh, of the original 1880s fabric uh, to the extent possible. Um, there will be elements that are, are removed that will accommodate this new site scheme. Um, the former carriage house behind the Wilberton house um, will be will be removed and uh, commemorated. Uh, the southern sun, sun room, which is a wood frame uh, construction, uh, and their additions between you know 1914 up to the 1980s, um, they will be removed for the Wolverton house. And a rear, uh, small rear uh, brick wing to the Wolverton house will also be removed. The the church addition, mainly the 1913 uh, Sunday school and its south-facing vestibule will also be uh, removed. Did I leave out anything there, Emily? Is that, did I get it all? Yep. Yeah, sorry, you got it. I realized we kind of had to flip back between nope. the two slides. So hopefully that covered it, yeah. Okay, super. Um, and then around retention, what we're looking at, as I mentioned, is, is um, uh, retention of the original 1880s uh, building fabric and um, a restoration scope will be um, outline for both the Wolverton and the church uh, building. And uh, what that rehabilitation will include is the, is the provision for um, commercial use and space at grade uh, and a second floor uh, residential use in the Wolverton house. For, for the 19L, uh, it will be maintained as a, as a, as a space for the community um, to, be, to be programmed. The, um, the new construction of uh, seven stories residential building uh, is, is uh, part of that new construction as well um, as a public uh, realm enhancement and program. And so we'll speak to that as well. So um, what, what Emily and I have, have done here is um, we, we went through the, the design proposal. We wanted to share with you, uh, lift the veil a little bit and share with you some of the feedback that, that we've offered to the team and that have been very much driving um, a, a design approach, but, but more importantly for, for, for our interest, um, a conservation strategy, one that actually does help mitigate any change or impact on those, on those heritage resources. So I'll just, I'll just spend the next five slides speaking to what those are specifically so we all can agree or understand what, what those mitigation strategies are. Um, so the first is around ensuring that the two heritage buildings are um, maintain their their integrity, and this is really important um, to conserve the the three dimensional built form. So that's right off the bat that that's a real kind of important starting point for us. The second, as as a kind of big fundamental move, is providing a significant setback from the street um, of of any new construction. So in other words, the building's actually located behind the church building and the Wolverton House. And those, those resources, they will sit proud and prominent in, in the uh, public realm setting. So that, those are our two big fundamental uh, moves off the bat. Um, the, the third um, move that we, we've, we've all been really thinking about carefully is, is what it is to create a large uh, plaza at the center of the site. And this is really important because it, 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 it's, um, straddled by both these uh, heritage buildings. And that the intent there is to invite the community to sort of interact and engage with those heritage buildings. Again, it provides a, a, a sort of diverse use of, of ground, ground floor uses, including retail, cultural, and community spaces. And, and ultimately the, the idea here is that this will promote a kind of animation of, of sorts um, in, in that public realm and, and on, on the site. Um, Emily, do you mind speaking just for a second to the um, uh, the, the, the mitigation of at, at, at grade there? 
Sure, here, number five. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so they've, can, we've- I'm Sorry, Emily, if you could make it full screen, I think it would be a little easier for us to see. If possible. Sure. Sure. Yeah, let me. Um, is that better? Now we've lost it, sorry. <laughs> oh, just me. okay. It's full screen on my screen. <laughs> oh, we just lost um, it. Okay. Maybe try and reshare. As Emily's pulling that up, um, th there, this this um, parking lot that I think many of us have um, have are, are quite familiar with um, at that surface and at grade. Um, the idea there is um, this 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 can be a better condition for for the community and in in the neighborhood and, and that in that context. Um, there was the, the, the move um, very early on to locate all that traffic and loading uh, below grade, and it kind of gets uh, 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 screened. Uh, okay, Emily, you got it. You got it up there. That's that's perfect. Someone got it up there. It's not me anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to continue with that, that kind of just ensures that the uh, parking traffic doesn't interact with the heritage buildings and doesn't. Um, disrupt that kind of pedestrian um, interactions with the building. And that 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 can actually really um, uh, often in, in development uh, and, and kind of sites like this make some awkward moments for you know the contested terrain between pedestrians and, and vehicular traffic. So that was something that um, we, we were very aware that if there's going to be a lot of foot traffic. We're right next to Main Street here and that's actually part of the character um, of, of this of this setting. Mm -hmm. And then I think next slide we've got. Um, yeah, perfect. So then um, uh, uh, as we as we go up the building uh, for the new new construction, <clears throat> again, we, we, we start with this pretty substantial setback from 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 the street. Again, we're behind the carriage building, but as we move up the building, the fourth and the sixth floor um, in kind of response to those heritage buildings, we're, we're set back um, further. Um, what this introduces and allows for in, in the downtown Grimsby is uh, rental housing. And um, to have this uh, in such proximity to Main Street is a real um, kind of positive uh, piece here. And, you know, we mentioned about the earlier policy context, um, and, and this is actually what um, is is expected in terms of a response to that to that uh, growth um, and accommodating that growth. So um, it's largely focused on the on the unbuilt portion of of the site, the sort of surface parking area, and um, you know with the retention of those original two buildings, um, uh, uh, you know the the footprints will be will be conserved and. Um, uh, as part of this sort of larger, larger, larger complex. Okay, and then um, this sort of sense of arrival was was a really important one. I think again, just considering how close we are to to Main Street. In the case of the Wolverton House, that's a specific kind of entry sequence, which is different than say a church. So we wanted some specificity and um, respect for those for those uh, entry sequences. And it really does communicate the historic relationship um, of, of residential entry sequence. And in the case of the church building, this is internalized and um, brings you know, it into a kind of community space with, within the, um, the building. And then Emily, we, we had spoken a little bit about, about unit types. Yes, and this was more so we wanted to share this today as part of the balancing of objectives. Of course, there's the heritage side, but also here allowing for growth and diverse um, uses and unit types um, to kind of introduce a new building form on this um, site that allows for the retention of these buildings, but also growth for the community. Great. And the next slide. So, so um, in, you know, in conclusion, um, the proposed development, in our in our opinion, um, uh, will conserve the cultural heritage values and heritage attributes of the site, um, as well as um, the adjacent and nearby heritage resources, uh, as as we kind of mentioned. 
um, the former carriage house and, and its associative value, it will actually be conserved through the retention in part um, of, the, of the Wolverton House to tell that story. What we're suggesting is, a, is a, a robust interpretation strategy to commemorate that site's history as well. Um, the proposal, it, look, it's been you know, really carefully designed and, and I hope folks sort of appreciate that to, to really minimize the impact on the heritage uh, uh, buildings. It's, it's something as heritage consultants, uh, we provide best advice um, to, to many of our clients. In this case, um, we were listened to. So I just wanna just flag that for, for, for everyone here. And that, that's a really honorable uh, situation to be in. And I think that minimal intervention approach to the actual buildings themselves to retain their three-dimensional form um, is, is, and you know, removing later additions, that's fully considered within the federal um, authored standards and guidelines of conservation of historic places. So um, uh, overall, we're, we're suggesting and, and um, that this, this proposal does conform with provincial and municipal heritage policies. And, and it is in line with best heritage practices. I would say, you know, next steps that we're we're, we're looking at. Next slide um, is, um, uh, you know, look, we've all agreed to um, achieve all of staff's recommendations from the um, November twenty third uh, uh, report, which which has just been uh, issued. Uh, many of these items they will be um, satisfied through upcoming and forthcoming site plan application. So we're, 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 we're still gonna be in a situation where many of you know, your feedback, continued feedback will be incorporated into uh, this, this design as it, as it evolves. And then I think next slide, um, so that this is the, the, the SAS comments. And the next slide, I just, again, in, for the benefit of what, what we're here today and your discussion and hear from, and we, we do want that, that, that feedback, um, uh, is to um, continue this ongoing relationship with with staff, with heritage staff, through a site plan application. Um, we understand staff staff report does go to to council. We we are um, uh, suggesting that in a heritage conservation plan, all the detail of the of the scope that we've kind of outlined on a high level here will will come forward and and again be presented to to this group, including a commemoration plan so we can really talk about the stories on, on, on this site. And then, and then lastly, that, that both buildings on the site um, uh, are recommended to be uh, designated under, under part four, and um, that the, the, the owner will work with the town to enter into uh, heritage easement agreements with really kind of lock in um, that, that protection long-term and secure the conservation work that's being described here um, probably most importantly, so that we all have assurances that that work does get done, and that's that's in accordance with um, the the Ontario Heritage Act. So, just in closing, um, we encourage this committee to to endorse staff's uh, recommendations. And I, I you know, uh, it's our it's our opinion, professional opinion, that this does follow best practices and conserves all the value um, and does not pose any uh, negative impacts from a cultural heritage perspective to uh, any of the adjacent uh, properties. And um, uh, we look forward to any, any feedback and comments and uh, we'll, we'll um, take that on. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for the, and uh, your delegation for uh, the presentation. Uh, I'll open it up uh, just to committee members if they have a question of the delegation with respect specifically to their, to their delegation. We will have the staff uh, recommendation report coming forward under business and that will be addressed separately so if committee members can focus their comments to the delegation on their presentation that would be great i see no hands if i'm missing any yell unmute ah oh, there's kate okay go ahead kate the presentation. I just have a, a small amount to say. Um, I am um, concerning the, the properties that you feel are, um, are of cultural significance. Um, I am concerned that there's not that many that you're listing that you feel are um, 
are significant in that area. Um, I think that um, personally, I would have I would have approached this differently if I would have known. Um, I know when we first started hearing about this development, we were assured that um, well, we were not. We were assured that the the owner of the property was a, a lover of heritage and um, and um, which uh, of course he, they are. Um, but um, I think we told a story in our own minds of what that meant. And uh, along Mountain Street alone, just alone, just alone, um, there's 19 listed properties. Um, and if I were to know, if I were to have hindsight, I would have pushed for a heritage district along Mountain Street because um, I see that it, it seems important to differentiate the building so that the, the two uh, future designated properties uh, will stand out. That's not what I would necessarily want to happen. I would want the building to, the new building to work and blend in with the heritage buildings and the heritage buildings along the whole area that I would ideally have um, as a district. Um, that it wouldn't detract at all, it wouldn't jump out. And I do find it concerning that um, there were no concerns that a seven story building here would not detract from the, the vistas. So I, I don't support this um, as, a, I think this is a seven story. Um, I, I do support intensification in the core, I, but I think seven, seven stories is, uh, is too much. So that's, that's that. Thanks, Kate. Um, Pamela? Thank you, Councillor Bothwell. I just wanted to say um, there likely hasn't been a rental property built in Grimsby in over 30 years. So it is well needed in this community. And um, I don't necessarily disagree with Kate, but I do like the fact that the building's different. I believe heritage, um, the way you had presented it, um, heritage is still um, forefront and center. It's being respected and it stands out. And I, I don't like faux heritage. I think we're here to preserve heritage, not recreate it. So I like the fact that the building is different. And I do appreciate how you've tried to stagger up to the different levels. Um, it does take away of all of a sudden this looming building over um, what is now there's the two heritage buildings. So I do appreciate that. And I also think there's a major challenge when you have two properties um, to work with. And I think you've done a good job on the design. And um, I, I think it's a great place for this community uh, to start with as an example. And um, I think you've done a good job with working with the heritage buildings. So thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Pamela. And, and if I could just, and I don't mean to jump cue here, but I. I think the, the the sentiment that you share with with Kate around you know what is what is what is the value of this of this place? Um, there's some really great rich uh, uh, heritage buildings and and value in this in this community. And I, I can say having you know written and and been part of and and you know many different heritage conservation districts in various forms. Um, uh, the the measures I just for everyone's benefit, the measures that we've spoken about today, um, they come from our understanding of, of uh, how heritage conservation districts do do work. So the distinction that you talk about, Pamela, is 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 like really front and center in in most of those most of those documents. And it's about it's it's not about locking something in in a look. It's about you know hoping to balance. Um, Whole bunch of objectives and manage growth as it happens um and that and that's really whether there's an hcd here or not we're, we're actually all of us are having that that same conversation about what is it to manage growth um and how is it mitigated with with our resources thanks thank you uh any other members of committee have a question for the delegation on their presentation and
Oh, you're muted, Ann. Thank you, Councilor Bosco. Sorry about that. Um, I would agree with Pamela and with Kate both. I agree. This is really well needed. The uh, the rental units in Grimsby, and especially in the downtown area. But I, I'm hung up on that seven stories as well. And I think from a heritage perspective, I think we have to think about the preservation of um, the vistas and the streetscape and what that main entrance means to Grimsby. And I just, just too much. And I think it, start, it will start a precedent of seven stories. That's where we're starting, right? So I can't support it for that reason as well. Okay, any other comments from? Committee. Kate, did you want to speak one more time? Just one more time. I just want to reflect on the Century Condo development that went through Heritage and Council over the last few years, um, more than a few years, I suppose, um, where our town planning staff worked heavily our, uh, of their new um, head of planning with their team, and they really worked hard um, and listened to the, the community. Who, who had a lot to say about what they wanted their downtown core to look like. And they worked very hard and redeveloped or redesigned and redesigned the plans to have this new building reflect or not necessarily be faux design, but it, it, felt, it felt like it fit in. It felt like it belonged in the downtown core. And, and it was a lot of work and it, it seemed strange to us, it seemed strange to me to, have a different development, a separate development, do the complete opposite. I, I just feel like we worked so hard to make one building fall, fit in that this is going to be a stark difference, this building. And this is just the beginning. Like Doran is all zoned for, for a higher density. Um, there's, there's going to be a lot more buildings like this. And um, absolutely, we do need rental in this town. Um, but um, there's going to be plenty of it with all this in the, the downtown zone for intensification. And I just feel like, um, um, yeah, I just feel those two points that there's going to be a lot of opportunity. And it just seems so odd that we worked so hard to make something um, fit in and feel heritage. Um, and this one is, we're not, we don't seem to be um, talking that way right now. Thanks, Kate. Uh, any other committee members? Philip, did you want to say something there? Or well, I just want to make sure I know the, the reference. Is that, um, Kate, is that the one on, on the main street there? Uh, the Century uh, building that you're speaking to? I, I just want to make sure I know that development. Yeah, it's on the main street. So it's a very different planning context. Okay. Um, and then further to that, um, they were, they're further advanced in terms of their development approvals. We're just at uh, official plan and zoning bylaw amendment stage. We haven't started the design stage, um, which is really, you know, starting to look at materiality and a lot of the finishing touches of, of this proposal. Uh, and maybe Antonetta, you can speak to the planning context. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Through Councillor Bothwell, are you okay if I speak? Yeah, I think we're, we're going to capture a lot in your report further on, but if you want to give a brief overview, that'd be great. Yeah, I would just say that the process that Kate is referring to was the town's first ever urban design review panel, and we have put that in our recommendations in the staff report that this building also be subject to an urban design review panel to see how we can build on the work that's already been done and ensure that it fits in even more with our historic area here. So just ensuring that that's also covered. Thanks, Antonetta. And I should just one more comment. Um, in terms of height, um, the official plan does um, highlight that um, council has discretion up to six stories uh, here, and we are seeking an amendment. Um, however, we feel that we're there's been a lot of intention to not only deal with the heritage, but to ensure, you know, a, a sufficient program to bring another life to these heritage buildings and to support intensification and activity, not only on the site, but the downtown and bring much needed open space and rental housing to the community. 
So it's um, we as a team, um, and we have also um, done some quite an extensive outreach to the community. Um, we feel that um, we've put forward a very strong proposal and we greatly appreciate the feedback uh, here this evening. Yeah, thanks Elsa. And, and to that point, um, uh, Kate and Pamela and Anne, um, we are, we do love heritage. Uh, we bought this site for a very specific reason and it was to rehabilitate these buildings and see a new life for them. Um, you know, we, it's a, the storytelling of this project is quite, quite fascinating. You know, we started with a restaurant and a pool hall, um, both those tenants left and these buildings were untethered from a commercial use and really um, in jeopardy. And what I see uh, today is um, a heritage plan, conservation plan that is really going to cement these buildings for the next hundred plus years. It's really the ultimate phase. And that brings me a great sense of, of satisfaction and I think across our team. So I think it's, you know, there's, there's a number of complexities with heritage buildings. I'm not gonna get into that, but I think what's first and foremost is that they have a future and that they're animated and that they serve the community uh, and businesses at large. And we, as Elsa mentioned, uh, we've gone through great lengths uh, through community engagement and really listening to the, the small businesses um, and visitors who look to downtown Grimsby to be more, to be a destination of landmarks, landmarks that you can participate in. And I feel really proud and honored uh, with, with the project that has been put forward and, and the thoughtfulness uh, that the architects, the landscape designers and our heritage consultant have put forward. I, I, I look forward to taking the next phase of rehabilitation, really delivering these buildings um, to the, their former glory um, that's contemplated here today. So th thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Harley, uh, and appreciate your leadership on this uh, on this project and your team bringing this delegation forward for the Heritage Committee today. Um, any other? I don't think there's any other questions. Uh, Sarah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Councillor, uh, and thank you to everyone for your presentation. Uh, I, I think it's really exciting what you are what you envision for the site with the community aspects and bringing rental housing to to the downtown. I am really excited about that. I do think the seven stories is a cause of concern that it seems like we'll be able to address in further you know as the processes continue. But I did have a question regarding the carriage house. Um, you mentioned. Uh, that you, you know, it's going to be demolished for the development, but that there is a possibly a commemorative aspect. Um, in your in your studies, were you able to identify any, you know, maybe is there anything original to the carriage house that we can bring into the new development, or is there like what what would a commemoration look like? Would it just be a plaque, or can, can there be something a little bit more integrative into the whole feel of of the? Uh, of, of the new design. So I'm just looking for a little bit more information about what you hope to do to, to remember uh, the Carriage House's story. Thank you. Uh, really great question, Sarah. We, I'll be honest with you, this whole um, uh, topic of discussion around storytelling is one that's uh, recently got quite a bit of you know wind in its sail. But we've we've actually been pushing for some time um, to do more on on interpretation and and commemoration. Um, uh, in in answer to your question, there's there's a lot of I'll say loss of integrity of what exists right now for the for for the carriage house. Um, what what I think is really important is functionally to understand. Um, the carriage house in function and service of the larger site uh, as a residential uh, building, and we can we can tell that story in any number of ways. You know, five years ago, the the sort of the limp in expectation was was a plaque, and plaques are really important. They're really you know um, important functional pieces for for folks when they when they visit the site. I go around with my boys. Uh, all the time we read all the plaques, we read them all, and um, they just they obsess about them. Uh, but there's other forms that we're, we're exploring of, of late and uh, commentary on change that frankly happens on the site. So we could tell that that story in a way, um, and there's, there's quite a bit of dialogue open to that. So I, I don't want to put any um, uh, limits to what commemoration looks like, but I, I think when we're, when we're ready to, to have that conversation, what we do is, 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 
is you know let's explore some precedents together and what makes sense on this on this site um and we can we can do that as a as, as a group once 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 we're at once we're at that stage thank you sarah and i will actually i've been asked to teach a course at laurentians around interpretation and storytelling so you know this in fact might be a really great one um to to speak to when when we're ready thank you thanks philip Sarah, are you all good? I'm not sure. Why. Anybody else um, before we move on? So I'll, I'll thank the delegation again and Harley uh, for coming and speaking, and we'll be dealing with uh, the report under our business item. Um, I would like to, if I can have a mover and a seconder to resolve that the delegation regarding 19 Elm and 13 Mountain Road be received, please. I can have a mover, uh, Pamela, and a seconder to receive the delegation. I have Sarah, all in favor. It's carried. Thank you again. We're going to move on to the next delegation, which is the 262 Main Street East presentation, Nixon Hall. And we have uh, Leo Wallace and Jared Marcus for this one. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's, a, it's a short two-part presentation. I'm just going to give a, a brief planning overview. I know there are some of the members here tonight were on the public meeting that was held last night. Uh, some were not. So I'll give a brief planning overview of the project. And then uh, Ms. Wallace has uh, her own presentation that'll detail the heritage uh, component of the project. <clears throat> so my name is Jared Marcus. I'm here from IBI Group uh, on behalf of the owners of the, prod, uh, of the development lands, which are West Niagara Enterprises, Inc. And we're propose our development uh, features a draft plan of subdivision and a zoning bylaw amendment. Um, so the first slide before you just gives you a bit of a, a context for the project. It's located at the northeast corner of Linden Lane and Main Street West. Um, our, the project, of course, is outlined here in blue. It's approximately 36 meters wide and 125 meters deep uh, and a site area of approximately 4,000 square meters. The, of course, the subject lands feature the designated structure Nixon Hall uh, with the rear of the property uh, having uh, vegetated uh, screening around the perimeter and a uh, white board fence along Linden Lane uh, to the northeast, uh, to the east, or excuse me, west and north of the project is a low density subdivision that was built in the 2000s. And of course, to the uh, north and east of the subject lands is the Van Geest uh, greenhouse, which is uh, currently being uh, decommissioned. And then, of course, on Main Street, you have the uh, the historic uh, lotting pattern that you'll see there. Uh, the next couple slides will show the uh, the context of uh, the planning context of the subject lands in the Grimsby official plan. The lands are designated as low density residential area. You can see a small red circle which identifies the ge general location of the subject lands. Uh, the next slide shows the context in the zoning bylaw. The lands are outlined in the red. Uh, line there and they are uh, zoned Main Street 15 and 15 being a maximum lot coverage percentage. Uh, the next slide gives a brief overview of those uh, of that planning context. So again, the official plan low density residential area that permits singles and semi detached dwellings with a maximum height of two and a half stories and a maximum density of 25 units per hectare. And the current zoning of the entire subject lands is uh, Main Street 15, and again, that permits singles and a max lot coverage of 15%. Uh, as I mentioned, our development proposal is seeking uh, approval of zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision applications. Uh, and we are changing uh, zoning from uh, Main Street 15 uh, to RD4 with a site specific uh, on the back 60 meters of the property and the front 60 meters of the property would retain as, or uh, remain as Main Street 15 with some minor site exceptions that I'll show you in a moment. And the subdivision application, of course, proposes five lots. The next slide should show you the uh, 
subject lands and uh, what the development proposal is. So you can see on the rear half of the property, we're proposing five 12 meter uh, or 40 foot lots that would uh, uh, cover the rear 60 meters of the property and the front 60 meters of the property would be uh, the existing heritage structure, the Nixon Hall, which would remain in situ. Um, the lots at the rear will be uh, a similar size and scale to the existing lots on Linden Lane and Sumac Court, and they would range in size from 392 to 365 square meters. Um, the next slide, uh, I, I had a different presentation that I uh, forgot to send out. It uh, changed up a few of these slides, so that's that's all right. This just gives a a view of what we're proposing at the rear, which is uh, maximum building envelopes, which are typical of suburban style developments that you see already on the street. Uh, typical 20 meter or six meter front yards, typical seven and a half meter rear yards. <clears throat> and uh, you can see here just on the left of your screen what the separation from the existing dwelling to the future lots would be. It's approximately 11 and a half meters or 38 feet. Uh, the next slide show would show then the, the proposed uh, regulations that we're changing um, on the lands to be zoned RD4. That's the rear half of the property. So that would be uh, some minor changes to uh, reflect front yard and rear yard setbacks, uh, which would be Linden Lane and the east lot line, uh, minimum lot area and maximum lot coverage. Uh, the next slide should show the context of the existing heritage house, which it does. I had slightly amended this so that it was just a little more clear, but that's fine. You can see here that the existing house remains in situ. We're not, there's no plans to alter that. Uh, as you're also aware, uh, uh, there, the current tenant has been doing some work to remediate the exterior facade of the building to improve that. And I understand there was a heritage grant that this committee uh, approved a couple months ago. Um, the zoning amendment also reflects uh, some changes needed to the existing context uh, of the dwelling on this lot. So there's some uh, zonings change over the years, of course. So the zoning in place uh, doesn't accurately reflect what this, where this dwelling is. So there's some uh, relief for the front porch uh, and it's uh, uh, how far it is out in front of the house. There's relief requested for the overall length of the building, which doesn't match the existing zoning. Um, and we're asking for a new provision to reflect the new lot, uh, new rear yard depth, which would be created by this new, uh, new lot line. So where the bylaw requires, uh, I believe it was 50 feet or so, we have uh, proposed uh, this 11.5 meters or 38 feet. Uh, so that's that's the planning context of where we are. My uh, second, uh, I had added, I had added some uh, additional slides to provide an overview of where we were in the planning process. But again, I forgot to send that to uh, to Peter. So that was just outlining how we got to where we are. Uh, so of course, we had a public meeting last night, as I mentioned. Uh, we had a open house meeting in October where uh, residents and council were able to provide some comments to us. Uh, we're at the Heritage Committee tonight and we're seeking Heritage Committee to of course uh, provide their support to this uh, proposal and then following this meeting staff will uh, conclude their technical review of the report and a uh, recommendation would come uh, hopefully in the next couple months back to Planning Committee and uh, ultimately Council for approval. So that kind of gives you the uh, general overview of the planning pro planning process for the development application. Uh, and that should be the conclusion of my slides. And uh, Ms. Wallace is here to provide an overview of the heritage context of the proposal. Um, yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Leah Wallace and I'm a, a heritage planner with uh, experience both as a municipal planner and also in the private sector. Um, and I prepared the heritage impact assessment for Nixon Hall at 262 Main Street West. Um, there was a peer review and I made uh, a number of changes to the 
and additions to the heritage impact assessment, which was then resubmitted to the, um, to the staff uh, at the town. Um, and uh, hopefully everything's fine. Um, anyway, I'm going to speak basically to uh, impacts uh, to the setting of the house um, and, um, and, a, and a number of issues with the, with the streetscape or the cultural heritage landscape um, and specifically con um, concentrate on those, those issues with respect to the impacts on this property. Um, so as you can see, there is the house and there is the, um, the Tremaine map picture of the house as it was in about 1862, um, not long after it was built. Um, okay. Just trying to get it to move <laughs> to the next screen. Um, I'm going to actually have to, okay. Chair, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Leah, I, I'm in control of the slides now. Okay, could you go Are to you the, if you're in control of the slides, thank you for telling me. <laughs> could you go to the next slide? Oh, go. could you go back to the previous slide, please? Um, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just as Jared talked about the, the location and the overview, you can see that the developments that surround the house, um, that it's, uh, it's changed, the, the site has changed a great deal from when Dennis Dixon owned it, and it was farmed and stretched all the way to Lake Ontario. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, uh, again, that's the development um, as it was. Um, as it is proposed. Um, and the next slide. And again, you can here you can see the possible impacts on nearby cultural heritage resources. Um, I have identified some of them. Um, there is the there is there are two designated properties that are nearby, one of which is the stone, um, the stone cottage. And the other, which is uh, called, it's simply called an Edwardian dwelling. It was moved when that subdivision uh, was um, was built, and um, and then uh, um, I think it was more or less renovated and restored. Then there are um, two or three um, buildings that are list or properties that are listed on the register, and. Uh, and um, so those are the properties that are adjacent to it. We can see the greenhouses here and uh, a number and a large green space to the south. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and I, I've used a lot of pictures, pictures, you know, the old saying, pictures worth a thousand words. So this is uh, the view from Linden Lane looking at the stone cottage and then looking east from the stone shop or stone cottage to, um, to the house. I think my illustration here is meant to, to show that uh, when the subdivision is built, certainly the impacts on the, the stone shop are going to be um, minimal, that, they, that that subdivision will not really be visible from the, uh, from the stone shop. Um, and the stone shop will not be impacted um, by, that, by the subdivision development. Go the next slide, please. And then um, here is the house at 268 Main Street West, which is designated. Um, and you can, you can see uh, from this, as I was standing uh, looking east um, with 268 in the distance, that again, there is no real impact on 268 Main Street West from the development that is proposed. And the next slide. Uh, this is the one house uh, which is listed on the register at 266 Main Street West that will, uh, where, the, where the subdivision will be visible to it, especially um, from the side, uh, from the Linden Lane side. Um, it has already had a certain number of impacts. It, the, there is a house 
in that subdivision uh, on Linden Lane that is uh, sits right behind it, uh, though it is well screened from that, that house. Um, but that is the one property where the subdivision will be visible. And the next slide. Um, I wanted to talk about the evolution of the Dennis Nixon property, the, this, the 1876 um, Atlas map uh, on the right and the Tremaine map on the left. And at that time, as you can see, um, Dennis Nixon had a farm that, that is characteristic of the farms in, on Main Street that stretched all the way from Main Street to the lake um, and from the escarpment to the lake. Um, and, uh, and that's the way it remained for quite a number of years. Um, but then uh, if we have the next slide, um, over those years, however, um, there was the construction of the railroad, um, eventual construction of the um, Queen Elizabeth Way, uh, changes in, uh, in land, division, etc. You can still see even in the uh, 1930s and 1950s, there was a lot of fruit farming going on and that did continue uh, for a number of years. But nonetheless, the farm is beginning to be cut off from the lake um, and in the distance. So, uh, and the next slide. And here it is in 1934. Um, you can see the greenhouse development in behind, and again, the farm is shrinking considerably, uh, though fruit farming is still being carried on. Uh, it's not clear that that fruit farming is associated with 262. And the next slide. And the 2000 aerial of Linden Lane and Sumac Court that shows them under construction. And then in 2018, the development and the land division that's gone on around it, tremendous number of um, subdivisions in behind buildings on Main Street. However, the Main Street streetscape is pretty consistent. Uh, a lot of that development has happened in behind. And so the setting for the uh, Nixon Hall has been maintained quite well over the years. And the next slide. So I was asked to do a statement of significance um, with a proposed list of, of heritage attributes for uh, Nixon Hall um, that updated the designation bylaw, which was done before the, um, many of the changes to the Ontario Heritage Act and changes to how we evaluate um, buildings and properties under the Ontario Heritage Act with Regulation 906. And certainly it, it concerns to a great deal the, um, the building itself, which is an extremely interesting uh, and a good example, Gothic Revival buildings, quite an, um, an imposing house. Um, and, but I have added the siting of the building on the lot well back from the street behind an to be an elaborate wood fen wooden fence. Um, and I think that that's also very important. I am aware that there is um, a movement afoot to designate Main Street as a heritage conservation district. I also know that there's been a lot of work done on the, the streetscape and cultural landscape of, um, of Main Street, west and east, and that, that, that uh, pre preserving and conserving that appearance is extremely important. So that's, to me, is an important um, characteristic of this property. And if I could have the next slide. Um, its current street scape character from Linden Lane is, uh, is obscured by the fence, um, the board on board fence. Uh, you can see there's some plantings of trees there, but I, I thinking they're not as old, that old um, coniferous trees, but you cannot see the rear yard of this property. What you can see is the development on Linden Lane, um, the subdivision and Sumac Court when you look down that. Uh, and so that streetscape is 
it's not really visible um, or it's hidden behind the fence, uh, the rear yard of, of uh, Dixon Hall. The next, next slide, please. However, um, in terms of the siting and the presence of the house on the lot, that's pretty consistent. We have the, the fence, it closely resembles the fence in, in the uh, Tremaine map image. The house has some changes. The portico is rather different. Um, there are some changes to the window openings, etc. but a lot of the character remains. Uh, the trees are there, um, the, the lawn is there, um, and none of those features are meant to be removed when the, when the subdivision is constructed. So the characteristics that the, the house retains in the streetscape, its setting in the landscape will not be changed and altered um, uh, beyond what has happened over the years. Um, and the next slide, please. And this is my final slide. And again, I'm juxtaposing um, the existing house with the fence and the Tremaine map, um, Tremaine map uh, image that was um, paid for, I believe, for Den by Dennis Dixon. He was obviously very proud of this house. And as you can see, that setting is, uh, is pretty consistent. It's being consistently maintained. To me, this is a, a significant house in a significant setting, and it's very important to maintain that. And, um, and I think by having the subdivision in behind um, as an extension of the Linden Lane Sumac Court subdivision, um, it's, it, it maintains the streetscape value of this, of this very important property. I have read the recommendations uh, of the planning staff. Certainly, um, I agree with them. A conservation plan is significant. This house is undergoing some restoration, is my understanding. And that is important because it is a large and complex house. And any conservation that is done on it will not be inexpensive and will require expertise. Um, and I think this permits that to happen. I uh, also, um, I, I believe there should be some kind of temporary protection plan associated with the conservation plan. Um, so that while the construction is going on, especially of the um, lot closest to Nix, the rear yard of Nixon Hall, um, that will then um, protect the house from any vibrations that may occur albeit for a short period of time. Um, I also think it's right to have some urban design um, issues associated with the new buildings, particularly those closest to Nixon Hall, and to have some um, screening uh, combination of, of natural and fence screening between Nixon Hall and the new, new development in behind. So that's generally my presentation. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to ask. Thank you, Leah and uh, Jared. Thank you for your presentations. I'll, again, we have this item as a report coming forward under business, um, but I would welcome committee members if they have any questions of the delegates, or the delegation. I don't see any hands asking questions. Okay, so at this point, I've got a motion that's resolved that the delegation regarding 262 Main Street East be received, and I need a mover and a seconder, please. I've got Mark and Anne, thank you. All in favor? Thank you, it's carried. Thank you again, Jared and uh, Leah, for your presentation. Uh, much appreciated, and we'll move on to our next agenda item. So we've got uh, business, and uh, we'll go to the report, and I think Antonetta is going to speak to 19 Elm and 13 Mountain Road recommendation report, please. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Uh, Bianca is actually going to speak to the report. I'll pass it over to her. Thank you uh, through you, through you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the delegations. Um, they did a really detailed presentation. So I'm going to focus um, my comments on uh, our staff recommendations to ensure the overall integrity of the heritage site. I will note that all of these recommendations um, are available on the heritage agenda um, for those watching. Um, so I'm just gonna go through those recommendations now. And again, just a reminder, this is 19, um, Elm, uh, sorry, 19 Mountain, C Mountain Street and 13 Elm, just not to confuse it with the next in Hall site we just had. Um, so recommendation one is staff recommend the retention of the building fabric of the Wolverton House and the church building. Staff recommend that the two heritage structures, 19 Mountain Street and 13 Elm, Elm Street be designated under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act and that the town enter an agreement with the applicant to designate these sites and that the applicant agree not to object to the designation. Number two, staff support the demolition of the carriage house because it does not merit designation under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. Staff also support the removal of the rear and side additions. Staff recommend that measured drawings of the carriage house and the various additions be submitted to the satisfaction of the Director of Planning and that professional photo documentation be conducted for both the carriage house as well as its placement within the existing street, streetscape and that these documents be shared with the archives for their records. Recommendation number three. Staff recommend that the salvage of materials occur to the greatest extent possible for both the carriage house and the additions. Recommendation number four, staff recommend that a heritage conservation plan be submitted during the site plan phase of the application to address any potential disturbances to the heritage properties, including the following precautionary measures, construction hoarding, crack monitors, vibration monitors, and other measures as needed. Staff recommend that the restoration of both the Wolverton House and the church building in general masonry repair and cleaning be conducted in accordance with best practices outlined in the future heritage conservation plan. Recommendation six, staff recommend that the conservation measure measures within the heritage conservation plan be undertaken in accordance with best practices outlined within the standards and guidelines for the conservation of heritage places in Canada. Recommendation number seven, staff recommend that access be provided to heritage professionals on staff to perform regular observation of all vibration and crack monitoring devices, as well as overall observation of the subject site. Staff will re reference best practices and property standards during this observation. Recommendation number eight, staff recommend that financial securities be taken for the conservation of the heritage fabric and that the restoration strategy be detailed within the heritage conservation plan. Recommendation number nine, staff recommend that the proposed setback and proposed green space be maintained within the site plan phase of the application to ensure the reveal as much of as much of the heritage buildings as possible. Recommendation 10, staff recommend that the top stories of the proposed development be maintained and stepped back and that the appropriate materials be used to help blend the modern layer, modern layer into the established streetscape. And recommendation 11, staff recommend that finishes and materials be addressed during the site plan phase of the application in accordance with best practices in consultation with regional urban design staff and that if required, the applicant agree to an urban design review panel. Staff have thoroughly reviewed all materials pertaining to this heritage the heritage components of this application and are generally satisfied with the above noted recommendations in place that the heritage of these structures will be conserved through the proposed adaptive reuse of the buildings and the affiliated development application. Thank you. Thanks, Bianca. Um, I'm going to just uh peter i was just reviewing the uh the motion that you sent me the amended motion uh, against what bianca just spoke to um, of the recommendations in the report and i just wanted to clarify 
um, in the motion that you sent me, uh, paragraph three, that the town enter into an agreement with the applicant to designate these structures and um, and it was missing and that the applicant agree not to object to the designation. That, so I'm just, that, that's correct, Councillor. Right? Yeah. That's what you, that's what you said. It just wasn't on the motion that's before me, Bianca. So yeah. when I read it, I want to make sure I'm capturing um, the complete uh, the complete wording. So Peter, I'm just going to add that to the motion that um, that you sent me. Can I, um, and we'll go through this again. It is quite a long, Bianca, thank you. It's quite a long recommendation, which will again be repeated as a motion. Um, and there's quite a number of items in there that you've captured um, for consideration of the Heritage Committee. So I'm hopeful that the committee has had an opportunity to review it. I know it's it's quite complex and there is a lot of detail in it. Um, are there questions for Bianca and uh, um, on, the, on the report and these recommendations from committee members? Open it up to you guys. If everybody is happy with every single one of those recommendations and there isn't a single question. Okay. I, I, I'll, okay, Sarah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you for reading that very long list of recommendations. I was like wanting you to have water so badly during that. But anyway, <laughs> um, I don't know if, when it's appropriate to ask this, but just given what I asked the delegates regarding if you're if they're able to incorporate any of the old carriage house into the new development, is that something that we can recommend like more actively looking at a commemorative aspect of preserving the, the stories of the of the carriage house? Is that something that we can incorporate into into the staff recommendation? Thank you for your question, Sarah, through you, the chair. Um, yeah, so this could be uh, included within the heritage conservation plan um, during the site plan. And we would ask for kind of like that commemoration plan, what they are thinking um, to commemorate that building. As Philip had mentioned, typically you would start at least with a plaque and then we would be um, looking for other ways to interpret it. And sometimes that could be through um, you know, having an artist artifact artifact display with smaller plaques and things like that within the development. Um, you could have um, uh, the ability to have oral stories shared with the community. So there's many ways within the field that they can do that. And I'm I'm sure you know Sarah <laughs> working with the museum, um, but that's definitely something we could ask to be included within the uh, heritage conservation plan. Um, and we could also request a commemoration plan. Are you good with that? All good, Sarah? I thank you. I just I just wanted to clarify. I just I don't I just want to make sure that something like that doesn't get lost in the shuffle. But if there are processes coming forward where we can revisit how to commemorate, you know, old historic buildings that unfortunately I understand if there isn't if if it doesn't meet the the standards to to you know to, to demolish, but I just don't want it. I just want to make sure that those um there's more opportunity and that doesn't get lost in the shuffle is all is all I'm wondering. So thank you. Bianca, could you maybe clarify or Antonetta if uh, the, the what the concern that Sarah has that because it talks about the heritage conservation plan will be submitted during the site plan phase. Will this be part of what that will incorporate? If you could explain that, maybe Antonetta. Through Councillor Bothwell, I was actually going to ask add something different. Why don't we add a clause that says that staff recommend that the commemoration plan for the carriage house come back to the heritage committee for their consideration so we can look at a plaque and then once they've looked at the building more thoroughly they can see if there's any pieces that are actually of significance that are worth saving who knows maybe even collaborate with the museum I don't know there's an endless array of opportunities there so 
why don't we have the consultant team go back, see what's actually feasible, but also meaningful to the history of the building. Maybe it gets incorporated as art into the lobby of the building, but those are all details we don't know yet. So why don't we ask them to go back, create a, com a commemoration plan and return to the committee at a later date with their proposal on how to commemorate the carriage house. I think your first statement about was um, and actually looking at retrieving and salvaging. So I, I don't think it's just the commemoration plan and come back later. How did you word that originally, Antonetta? Peter, I don't know if you captured it. I'm hoping someone captured it. Because <laughs> uh, it, it was it sounded a little bit more uh, direct as in um, salvaging and actually looking at um, recoverable materials and bringing then bringing back some type of a plan to this committee. New chair, sorry, I did I was not able to capture that. Um, do you want to try to revisit that thought, Antonetta? <laughs> yeah, I can try and draft something now yeah. and then uh, I can read it out loud. Please, that would be great. I'll give you a minute and then later we'll we'll go back to comments from committee and then I'll have you come back when we go to read sure. the to incorporate that paragraph. Thank you. Um, Sarah, are you good with that? And we'll come back with some wording that'll get into the into the motion. Okay, any other uh, uh, committee members wish to make a comment or speak to the Wolverton proposal here and the recommendations in the report? Um, Peter, this is, um, I'm going to do, I know I can't do the debate and stuff, and I know I'd like to make an opinion or a comment. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if Kate's still on here somewhere, is she still on? Good. You're here, Kate. I'm going to step down just like they call it stepping down out of the chair. So I can just make a quick comment and ask staff a question. And I'm going to put Kate just sitting at the chair level for like one question. Is that good with you, Kate? Absolutely. Peter, are you okay with that? Yes, thank you, Chair. So I've stepped down. Kate's now the chair. I'm just going to direct one question just to uh, be. Oops, Bianca. Did I? <laughs> Sorry about that. I think I'm doing the mute and the unmute thing here too, and I'm getting myself all mixed up. Um, I, I know that um, there's going to be a lot of thought put into the urban design and the um, and how the site plan comes back. Um, when it talks about this in the standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada, it states to conserve the heritage value and character defining elements when creating any new additions to an historic place or any related new construction. Make the new work physically and visually compatible with, then comma, subordinate to and distinguishable from the historic place. So what's your thoughts on um, if this, if the seven story massing actually meets that kind of criteria of being subordinate to? That's my first question. Thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, I'm glad you brought up um, that part of the standards and guidelines um, because I think it's a, a healthy balance between the three. Um, you wanna ensure that it's being compatible. You want to ensure that it's distinguishable and you want to ensure it's uh, subordinate. So that's where some of those questions from earlier um, about ensuring that the materials contrast each other. So if you want to ensure that that heritage building stands tall and is not um, being impacted by that mass behind it, then you would want to use a contrasting color, which would ensure that that heritage building is still standing proud. Um, and so we'd be working to ensure that the materials on the rear part, the larger massing, um, blend with in the, the um, current landscape and they differ from the heritage. And then that way it's almost like um, that heritage is popping forward and the background is kind of camouflaging into the surrounding uh, landscape. Thanks. Um, and I guess because I was looking at the actual the document for the standards and guidelines, and there's an ac excellent example of Strathcona Public Library in there on page 130. Anyway, it shows the the historic library with an addition behind it, but it's not it doesn't like it's actually integrated into it at the same height, but yet it's got some more glassing instead of brickwork. It just looks very compatible, but yet not overwhelming and overbearing. So um, I Will this, will the Heritage Committee be getting 
Will this come back to us um, with the Heritage Conservation Plan? Will we be seeing that? Will we be seeing the site plan? Um, will we have any input, input like the region with the region design staff um, into the into that the design uh, charade that they're going to be doing? Will we, as a heritage committee, have any impact on those at those stages? Uh, thanks. Thank you for your question, um, Councilor Buffalo. Um, through you, the chair. Um, yes. Yeah, so. When similar to how we did with um, Century Condos, where we were able to bring that presentation forward to you to see how that design charrette worked together, um, it's really during that phase we really get into the details of the materials, like you said, mixing in of the glass. Um, and if you have a glass structure like that, then you're not having any blurred lines as to what is authentic and what is new. So those are where those efforts are going to be made to ensure the mediation. Um, of the heritage resource. And that presentation will be coming back to the committee along with the heritage conservation plan. And it will be through the conservation plan that, that we ensure the integrity of the structures and um, we have uh, that monitoring in place that we can continue to uh, check on. Uh, thank you. And one last question, the designation of the two buildings where it does state that um, will enter into an agreement and to designate them and that they won't object. Um, have, have we got the wording of those two designation documents drafted and peer reviewed now? Or are we at a stage where they're... Just get it um, thank you, uh, Councillor Bothwell, for your question through the chair. Um, so the actual designation reports um, are in draft format. I've already conducted my evaluation against 906, uh, both of the structures merit designation. So um, that initial um, document is in draft form and um, those, um, those are can be eventually brought forward to move forward with the designations. Um, but what we, what we would be looking at is getting some form of document whether it be in the form of a letter um, from the applicant agreeing to not object to the designations, and then we can work through that process while we um, do the application. There's no um, hostile um, uh, oh. other side, so we wouldn't face an appeal. So we can work together and make sure they're perfect and then make sure that the uh, bylaws are in uh, conformity with Bill 108. So. I guess I'm just thinking of the timing because they are going to be looking at doing some demolition um, and they'll need a demolition permit and which will be a heritage permit to do demolition, correct? Um, so we will, will that, and I, I don't know what stage that's going to come in through this approval process. And I just want to make sure that perhaps that we have the designation reports in place before the demolition permits are issued. I don't know if, because it just, if there's a potential that the demolition could impact uh, a, an attribute that we're going to be does like how does that work with timing um thank you councillor bothwell so uh we have a 906 conducted for the carrot house that shows that it does not merit um, designation so if say that this was a site that's not currently in the form of an application but they had wanted to remove a structure then it would become before um council and they would require permissions to take the structure down um so due to i would guess the um reactiveness of it because they're not technically designated right now um then we would go through that process to remove the structures um but that process will also be um, included within the management plan so we can see how all of those additions coming down and we will ensure that um when the buildings are coming down, obviously there's going to be vibrations and things like that. And we're equipped to uh, handle those kinds of situations and ensure that the proper equipment are installed on the structure and that monitoring is taking place. I think I was more thinking about the removal of the additions to the Wolverton house and the church structure that like the, the porches and all those things, if those could be, if those are going to be done, like if they, because potentially they could take them down now because the buildings aren't designated. Right. I just wondered if there's any, um like like if those types of actions were going to happen i don't expect they will i expect this the timing will be after site plan and after the heritage conservation plan and everything i just wanted to make sure that they're and i i don't expect they're going to do anything pre preemptive but um 
that's just my concern is there's a potential that some of those parts of those buildings could be removed, right? Um, thank you, Councillor Bothwell, through the chair. Um, so it would work the way I had said for the carriage house. We do need council approval before they can take any of those additions, additions down. And we would be doing similar to what we did there at that property on 30 Road, where we would evaluate to see if there's significance and then they would be uh, okay. removed, but they've proactively done the evaluations on these additions. And then in a way for us to understand what has happened to the site, even for future generations, that's why we have proactively asked for those detailed drawings to show what was here and um, their, how they look within the landscape. So that'll be really important to um, have for our records and that's best practice if you are to take an addition down, so. Perfect. Thank you. That, that answers all my questions. Much appreciated. Yes. Um, thank you. So I'm going to I'm going to move myself back from being one of the, the the little committee members here now back up to the chair. Kate, if you don't mind relinquishing your chair. Thank you, Kate. Peter, are we OK? Kate's relinquished. Am I back? Yes, thank you. That's thank you. Um, now that I'm back, Antonetta, I just wondered if you had the wording that you'd like me to add to the end of this motion, and then I'll, I'll just double check there's no more comments from members. Through Councillor Bothwell, I can't promise it's the same, but I think it captures the intent. Staff recommend that the applicant return to the committee with their commemoration plan, including the exploration of salvage and reintegration of significant materials of the carriage house. I can type that and send that to Peter if the committee is agreeable. Please, that would be wonderful because then I'm going okay. to get I'm going to get Peter to read the whole motion again. Okay, we will do. Any other comments from committee members on uh, the Wolverton and the Mountain Street development as proposed and the and the uh, recommendations from planning, um, as Bianca has explained? I just want to give uh, committee members one more opportunity to speak to it uh, because this will then go to council. Um, part of their endorsement package, I'm assuming. So Sarah, yep. I thank you so much. Um, I did have a real question. There seemed to be some concern amongst committee members regarding uh, the proposal for the new build to be seven stories. Is there a way to integrate that somewhere into a motion or writing that we have expressed concern or does that come later? I would just like some clarification, clarification regarding that. Thank you. So Sarah, just to clarify, is it just the height or is it the massing that you're, what, what, what's your, is your concern just with the, the, the height of the built form or the massing of the built form with respect uh, to courage? Thank you. Uh, I, I guess, I guess it's the hiding because massing refers to like the idea that it's being stepped back, right? Um, I get, I, I just, my own personal concern, but also hearing concerns from uh, the com committee members today, it seemed to be both massing and height, but I think there seems to be mostly a concern with the, the height, the seven story proposal. So I'm not sure if that can be just that that concern was raised today. Um, so how would you like to word that? Not just that, that, that the Heritage Grimsby Advisory Committee feels okay Bianca go ahead thank you Councillor Bothwell um I just wanted to note um because it is higher just making sure that if they lower there might be an opportunity for encroachment on the resources so the fact that it's higher actually ensures that more of that building envelope is being um I guess um shown it's it's that the height is providing that opportunity for that setback so just to keep that in mind within your recommendations to keep in mind the the massing and things like that have been designed to be a little higher so that we're not engulfing the heritage buildings kind of gives us that luxury to have that setback um so sarah something like um the heritage committee expresses concern uh, with the height, with the seven story height of the build of the proposed building. Sarah, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think I just, I think I just want that on the record. We, we had some, some comments today. So I think if we can even just say, yeah, there, there's been a concern. Uh, definitely, I understand that regarding the massing, that maybe the height. 
allows for the setback. So I, I think I'm just, just asking for some record to be known that we've had that concern today. So I think what, what you put forward, Councillor Bothwell, sounds okay to me. I'm not sure if the rest of the committee has, has any other input or ideas, but thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I was thinking of adding this to the beginning of the motion. It's like just as a whereas that the committee expresses concern with the seven story uh, height of the proposed building and then move to resolve that the rest of the motion, just expressing it. What do you think, Antonetta? Through you, Chair Bothwell, I was gonna say that you can say that the committee expresses concern with the height and massing of the proposed building. Should the proposed development be approved, the committee recommends the following recommendations, basically, or conditions to it. And then that's where all of staff's recommendations would be listed. That's where your concern is acknowledged. And then we're also saying, should council make the decision to approve this? These are the pieces that we would like looked at to manage the heritage component. That way you're advising on the heritage aspect of it. That sounds good. Can you write that in your little email when you send it off to Peter, please, as well? And we'll get him to capture that at the beginning of the resolution. Thank you. Will do. So I appreciate everyone's patience. These are, um, it's quite a weighty agenda tonight. We have some really, really um, uh, important developments on, uh, on our agenda. So appreciate your uh, attention to them and to the reports. Um, I'm just gonna give Peter, let me know Peter when you've got that ready to go. And then I'm gonna get you to read the, the massive resolution one more time. And now we've got a quiet moment of silence here and a little bit of dead air. I was just looking at the recommendation again, Sarah, about that it says that staff recommend that the salvage of materials occur to the greatest extent possible for both the carriage house and additions. So I think that's because uh, it might be possible, I, and Bianca, maybe even that some of that porch. Um, well, I guess this the what additions, you know, there's that that thing that's deteriorating on the top. It's like the little bell cap thing there um, that's starting to deteriorate. What additions are put on that carriage house that might be worthwhile saving? What did you think, Bianca? When it talks about the additions. Thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, the additions are on the uh, back end of the church. Oh, and then be, that's going to be confusing in the motion then, because it says staff recommend that the salvage and materials occur to the greatest extent possible for both the carriage house and additions. It doesn't say additions to the church. So maybe we need to up, update that too, just so it doesn't mean additions to the carriage house or like I thought you meant if that's additions to the Wolverton, to the Wolverton house, like the porches and stuff. And the yes. Back. Yeah, so in Philip's presentation, he went over which ones were going to be removed. Yeah. So that resolution is speaking to the um, all removed additions and then the um, carriage house individually. Okay, do you think it's clear enough in that in that recommendation that it refers to not just the carriage house, but the other two buildings? Um, sorry, I'm just checking the, yeah. let me just check the wording one second. Yeah. 
because it might maybe it should say in additions to um, 19 Mountain and 13 Elmore to the Wolverton House and the church building or through you chair I uh, rather than read out each recommendation of ladies or just to have it on the screen okay I can take that down it's just right thanks thanks Peter do you think that's okay? Is uh, the committee does the committee feel that we're clear enough on what they mean by additions in the recommendation that's in front of us? I would just add that there's no additions to the carriage house. Yeah, so it so wouldn't it would it wouldn't really make sense to think it was an addition to the carriage house. Okay. Um, so it's the carriage house and then additions, and we could we could add all additions if that helps. Okay, well, actually, I think, Peter, you just added the salvage of materials occur to the greatest extent possible for both the carriage house. Sorry, and what did you say, Bianca? You could say in all additions, and then we can also add the address if we want on 19 Mountain and 13 Elm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. So we have at the beginning... That's good, Peter. At the top of this motion, express this concern with the height and massing of the proposed building. Should council approve the development application? Uh, Heritage Ministry Advisory endorses the following. Okay. So, um, staff, if committee just has a quick look, this is the motion that's in front of us. If you see anything that stands out as uh, needing amendment, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to ask for, a, I need a mover and a seconder for it as it reads on the screen. And as I think the only changes are what and, and Antonetta added the end here that the applicant returned the committee with their commemoration plan uh including the now we did see and now here Antonetta we've got a bit of a duplication other than we've talked about should this maybe go up um under that Recommendation with staff recommend the salvage materials occur to the greatest extent possible for both carriage house and additions, and that the applicant return the committee with their commemoration plan. Um, regarding, um, you can say including the potential reintegration of significant materials from the carriage house, if we want to do that, so that we don't repeat salvage. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to take out the expiration of salvage here because that's already in point number three in the recommendation, I think. Where it says staff recommend that salvage materials occur to the greatest extent. So this one will just deal with their commemoration plan, including the reintegration of significant merit. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. All right. So um, If, is everybody comfortable with having seen that motion on the screen to be able to move and second it? Can I ask for a mover and a seconder, please, for the motion that's presented? I have Anne as a mover, and I have Sarah as a seconder. So to the motion as presented by Peter on the screen to the committee members, I would ask all in favor. And that's carried. Thank you for your work on that staff and Peter on putting that forward and that presentation for the Wolverton development. I'm going to move to the next report. Uh, this is the 262 Main Street West and Bianca, are you taking this one on too? I am. Okay. Yes. Thank you uh, for your for you, the chair. Uh, bear with me, this is another long one, but I just wanted to um, point out really quick, this one's slightly different than the last one because that one is designated under the Act currently, so it will require heritage permits for all of the proposed works. So we are coming here today for the um, planning amendments, and um, we will be coming back to the committee um, with the conservation plan, but this time it will come with a package um, with a heritage permit. Um, 
So within that heritage permit right now, um, we um, would be asking for uh, specific mediation measures and things like that. So I'm gonna go in through the recommendations now again. Um, so heritage professionals on staff prepared the following recommendations to ensure the overall integrity of the site. I will note once again, the full recommendations are available for those watching uh, within the heritage recommendation report on the heritage agenda. The recommendations are as follows. Number one, staff recommend that the cultural heritage value identified on the subject site be conserved and that the integrity of this structure be maintained. Recommendation two, staff recommend that a detailed con construction plan be submitted with the heritage permits or heritage permit required for this application and that the construction plan provide mediation measures to address vibrations caused by extra e construction equipment along London Lane Linden Lane and at the rear of the subject property. Recommendation three, staff recommend that the construction plan mediate any potential impacts to the large butternut tree to the west of the heritage resource. Recommendation four, staff recommend that the detailed heritage conservation plan submitted with the permit ensures the precautionary measures are in place to protect the cultural heritage value of the subject site. These precautionary measures shall include construction hoarding, vibration, and crack monitors and other conservation measures needed as needed to mediate any impact to the heritage resource. Recommendation five, staff recommend that the conservation measures within the heritage conservation plan be in accordance with best practices outlined within the standards and guidelines for conservation of heritage of historic places in Canada. Recommendation number six, staff recommend that the act that access be provided to heritage professionals on staff to perform regular observation of all vibration and crack monitoring devices, as well as overall observation of the subject site. Staff will reference best practices and property standards during these observations. Recommendation seven, staff recommend that the designation bylaw be amended after the property receives approvals for the severance and that the property owner agree to the designation amendment and that the property owner agrees to not object to the designation bylaw amendment. It is also recommended that at this time staff update the designation bylaw to include attributes of culture heritage value, update the statement of significance, and update the bylaw to the new Ontario Heritage Act requirements established through Bill 108. Recommendation eight, staff recommend that vegetative screening be added on the proposed adjacent lot to the heritage home in order to maintain the views along the significant Main Street West corridor and that the vegetative screening provide a compatible and sensitive mediation to the potential visual impacts. Recommendation nine, staff recommend that the vegetative screening include trees found within the Carolinian forest in an effort to maintain and enhance the Carolinian forest species found throughout the town of Grimsby. Recommendation 10, staff recommend that securities be taken for the culture heritage resource for any potential stamina for any potential structural damages caused during the construction of the proposal, the proposed residential, sorry, the proposed residential dwellings to the rear of the subject site. Recommendation 11, staff recommend that detailed architectural drawings shall be submitted during the heritage permit application and that efforts be made to ensure compatibility and distinguishability with the culture heritage resource. Staff recommend that the fence removal recommendation within the heritage impact assessment be left to the discretion of the property owner. Heritage professionals on staff have thoroughly reviewed all materials pertaining to the heritage components of this application and are generally satisfied. With the above noted recommendations put in place that the heritage of the subject site will be conserved through the proposed development application. Thank you. Thanks, Bianca. We have questions from committee. So that's basically the recommendations that are, we're gonna be voting on um, each of those points that you just mentioned. Is there anything that people, uh, the committee wish to add or to look at the wording in any way? I'm not seeing any hands go up. Um, Kate, are you still there? Yes, Kate. 
I'm going to need you maybe just to step up into the chair just for a second. You don't have to visually be on screen if you don't want, if you'll just verbally say that you'll take my seat for a minute. I will take it. I'm, I'm sorry, committee. I'm just not well tonight and I'm just trying to not look so miserable on the screen. <laughs> Are you okay to take the chair? Just, um, I am. I am. Um, I am. Peter, thank you. Peter, are you okay? Yes. Thank you. Chair. Okay. So I'm just going to step down and ask, um, just, a. I'm just going to, I'd actually like to make my comments, um, for the record, um, in the minutes as well. Um, So I was reading the Heritage Impact Assessment Report and it was noted in there uh, by Leah Wallace, uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is the height. And in the report, she specifically states that there will be no more than two stories in height. This two story height is verified in the planning application submitted to the town, which proposes the RD4 zone for the subdivision. Um, and the RD4 zone limits height to nine meters. Um, she specifically states two stories, yet the applicant, um, both uh, last night at the uh, Nixon Hall open house and this uh, meeting tonight mentioned two and a half stories. So I have a, a concern that the um, peer review and the assess the heritage impact assessment is based on the abutting homes behind the property only being two stories when a two and a half story home may have some, some further impact to the, um, the height um, as it relates to Nixon Hall from the streetscape from Main Street as well as from Linden. Um, visually, it will have a bit of a greater impact at two and a half stories. Um, so that's just a comment. Um, I know that uh, the, the applicant certainly has the right under the zoning to do nine meters, which is two and a half stories. But I think that, um, um, when the heritage impact assessment was done, it it only looked at them as as two story, potentially no higher than two story buildings. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy there. Um, Bianca, did you want to say something about that, or you want me to just move on to my next question or comment? Um, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, you you're welcome to add that um, into the recommendations from the committee, um, but. You could just ask for the height to be sympathetic to the heritage home and because of that you would recommend it be as many heights as at the height you were saying um and then ultimately we would see um how we could mediate that impact but that's definitely a recommendation that um if the committee would want wants to add they can add that um i think you just have to show how that impacts the structure you're saying you don't want it to be overpowering to the heritage home, then you're welcome to add that in. But if the nine meters is permitted throughout the town. Yeah, it, it's yeah. the only, I guess the only thing then, I just wanted to note that because um, the second part of it is that there's a reduction request in the MS-15 zoning for the Nixon Hall lot um, to reduce it from it's uh, to uh, by, well, it was required to be 15.49 meters um the rear lot size and they're requesting a reduction in the zoning bylaw to 11.353 rear yard 38 feet versus um significantly 50 feet or some odd more um between it and lot five so i think that depth of the property to me is critical along the main street corridor for the the cultural heritage landscape and the main street landscape in the sense that um if you look at um uh, the lot fabric of some of the larger homes and estates along Maine on both sides, the depth of the lots is fairly significant. And I think a, a 38 foot depth is, um, is, would be, would lessen, um, significantly lessen the impact, uh, the, um, the heritage impact assessment also talked about protecting the lot fabric around it. And although it does talk about the setback from Main Street from the frontage, to me, the rear is just as important because this designation of this, this home is designated has a unique L shape uh, building structure and the rear of the structure has the L extension on it. And I think that um, um, two things visually. So not only that L shape needs to be protected at the rear of the property, I think by a, a, enough of a, a substantial setback to lot five. And that's because it has visibility from two main, 
from two street visibility sides. And the, Leah also noted that it should be more visible and more open from Linden Lane. And I think because you have visibility um, of this unique building from both Maine and Linden um, and um, removing the board and batten fencing, I would recommend that we take out that last um, recommendation in it where it says that it's at the discretion of the property owner because very clearly in the heritage impact assessment, it talks about it obstructing the, the view of the home from Linden, uh, Linden Lane. Um, and actually in their recommendations and the uh, scenarios, it talks about um, that it's detrimental to the streetscape character. Actually, it says uh, the issue of the board on board fencing along Linden Lane, which obscures the west elevation of the house in the rear yard and is detrimental to streetscape character and, um, as well uh, that uh, um, throughout the, the, the uh, uh, report, she talks about maintaining the picket fence along the front as well as perhaps even, even extending it along the side um, of the home. So, um, I think that the reasoning behind the height, my height concern being um, uh, sympathetic to the building is um, in relation to the visibility from both sides of uh, um, Linden and Maine, uh, that it's critical with the L shape of the unique shape of the home that we retain as much of the rear lot fabric as possible. I don't, I wouldn't support the zoning bylaw amendment to reduce the rear yard setback. Um, as they're requesting, even though that's not a heritage impact, but what I see it as a heritage impact being the proximity of the higher, um, uh, the density and the higher elevation of a home behind it with the visibility possibly from Maine or from Linden then being more noticeable um, on, on, the on the impact on the designated property. So um, I don't know if any other members of committee feel that there's a need to include in the recommendation report um, uh, I would like to add, I would like to remove, and I, I think I would need, I'd like to see a seconder to help me with that, removing the last sentence that says the fence removal recommendation uh, be left to the discretion. And I think that the recommendations within the heritage impact assessment be um, for the, the picket fencing and, and the vis uh, increased visibility to the rear of the property be maintained. I don't know, Bianca, do you want to help me with that? Um. Thank you, Councilor Buffalo. I just I just noted a few of your questions. If you don't mind, I'd like to just provide a, like some comments. So the reason the front setback is so significant is because it's unchanged. So from the beginning, that was its setback on the land. So that's why that setback is so important. The rear setback, and really our concern is to mediate that visual impact along Main Street. And the way that we're gonna mediate that is through the vegetative screening. So you'll have your fence between the property lines and then you'll have that vegetative screening in there and that'll kind of soften the look along Main Street. So that when you're driving behind that house, you don't see these, these new structures. Instead, you're seeing um, that vegetative screening, which helps to soften. Um, and then um, you spoke to the L shape. So I'm fairly uh, familiar with the site. So um, there is a, a setback or like a jet at the back of the house. Um, but there is a, I believe that we figured it to be early 1900s uh, garage to the rear, which was added to the house. Um, and then um, from, so I believe it's a 40 from the L shape edition, um, about 40. And then you have that garage structure at the back. So that setback there is really um, the garage edition rather than the original edition, um, the proximity. And I think that we could still maintain that um, historic feature by having that vegetative screening there. I wouldn't say that having a house there impacts views to that L because you're still having quite a big significance between the L shape and that addition. It's a fairly big garage there. Um, so if anything, that garage is also impacting that L shape, I would say, of the original. Um, so I just wanted to note that. Um, and then the fence, the reason I had said leave it up to the discretion of the homeowner is because it is an existing fence. It's not something that um, they're proposing to build. And um, as heritage property owners, I know there's um, a lot of onerous on them to do so much maintenance and um, 
I don't know the situation with who owns um, what, but I know the person who's in the home doing uh, the restoration work. It's very expensive restoration work and um, we felt that the fence should be left to the discretion of the homeowner. And if that's something that she wants to work into her, you know, conservation plan, maybe five, 10 years down the road, I would um, think we would want to support them in that. I just have concerns that just knowing how much the repointing is going to cost um, that I don't know how immediate is that on their plan. So that was just kind of some of my background behind that fence comment. Um, but just to provide some input there. I hope that was helpful. Um, thanks. I just think that we, you know, we're looking at a, a tenant in the home and we're looking at a fence that's the responsibility of the developer of the applicant of this development. And I think that where the heritage impact assessment has identified it as, a, as detrimental to the street safe character and that it should be removed and it should be replaced with something that increases the visibility to the, to the rear of the property. I think that that takes precedence over um, a tent, like the existing fence and, and perhaps because the, this is part of an app, a development application. Um, so the responsibility should be on the developer, not on a tenant in the, in the existing home. So, and I understand when we did the facade agreement that it was a joint facade agreement between the actual developer and, and the existing tenant. So, um, and I don't know if the property is again for sale because the, the, the applicant actually has it still on their website as for sale, the home on its own. So um, I don't know if they just haven't updated their website, but the potential is that um, we, we have to look, I think, too, as um, the, the current tenant who's working on it, which is great. I, but I don't know if that's the long term plan from the developer or the applicant to, ma to maintain the home with the existing ownership. And so I think anything we can do with respect to property standards and um, within this application to ensure that um, uh, the conservation of the property is maintained, um, we should be looking at that as part of the development process on its own. So I think, I, I don't think leaving the fence, the fence looks pretty awful, to be honest, like when you're going by, it just, it makes it look like it's, it's shuttering the property up. And I think um, it's a beautiful home and you can't see any of it. It's like, it's, it's a higher than standard fence even um, because it's on a corner. And I think that they might've, I don't even know if they had a permit to get the higher than standard fence um, for that, that street. But I, I think the heritage impact assessment is saying it's detrimental in my mind. Um, um, I, I'd like to see it opening it, opening it up because I think it's just gonna, it just doesn't do any justice to the home, but that's just my that's just my opinion. Thanks, Bianca. Appreciate appreciate your thoughts. Um, if the rest of the committee is fine with leaving it in, I'll leave it in. Um, I just I just wanted to raise that because I, I pulled it out of the heritage impact assessment and did feel that it was it was something that was repeated numerous times throughout the report. So I felt it was it was uh, it was important to the uh, to the um, reviewer. Um, that was it. Oh, the butternut. Um, and I know that they identified three butternut trees on the property, two of which are going to be removed. And the large one, which looks like, um, just from some other people who are familiar with butternuts, that it is a substantial mother butternut, um, in the sense, I think it's 80, the DBH is like huge, 80, 80 centimeters or something like that. I don't know, but it's very, very big. Um, although the health assessor said that it was um, possibly a hybrid sent it into the, to the MECP, didn't get a response, and as a result could just move forward with removing the two of them. And I know we're protecting this one. Can we ask for a DNA sample like we're doing with the one in Grimsby Beach? Just because if this is um, a native and not a hybrid, because they didn't actually confirm that it was a hybrid in the report, in the Arbor's report, he just said that from the care, it, it showed characteristics. So because it shows characteristics in his mind, and then he sent it up for a second opinion, and they didn't get back to him from the MECP or come in and, and do a visit. Can we request a DNA, just because it would be good in my mind to know if it is genetically um, native, then we may have something that we want to submit to the Forest Gene Conser Conservancy, whatever they are, to let them know we have, we have a mother butternut, you know, that might, they might want to make babies from. It's just a thought. If 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 we take the arborist report as it, it seems to have characteristics of, 
we can leave it of a hybrid, like of a hybrid, we could leave it at that. But in my mind, I'd like to go one step further and just do the DNA genetics on it, um, like we're doing with the one in Grocery Beach, if that's possible. What's your thought, Bianca? Uh, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. I think we can, I did say, oh, here. So recommendation three was staff recommend that the construction plan mediate any potential impacts to the large butternut tree to the west of the heritage home. And then we could say in here and that testing be uh, conducted to determine the, um, uh, Pure purity, I believe is the word, purity of the um, butternut species. So I don't know if Peter can add something like that in. I would appreciate that, Bianca, just okay. because then it'll rule it. Like if it does come back, yeah, it's neat. It's it's um, it's a hybrid, that's fine. But if it does come back that it is uh, genetically pure, then then it, it just would be, uh, although you are doing everything in your power, as I can see in, in your recommendations to protect it now, it just um, will give it a little more strength moving forward um, if it needs any type of work or whatever, or we might even look at designating the tree as part of the updated designation report that we're gonna be doing to protect it further. So that's just a thought. Yeah, we're happy to support you on that one. Uh, just putting something together here for Peter. Thank you, Bianca, yeah, just, appreciate it. Oh, one okay. sec. Yeah. Anybody else have any comments? I'm going to actually leave. I think I'm all finished with with um, bringing forward my opinions and comments to to um, staff, and I appreciate um, them listening to me. Um, I'm going to go back now and jump back in my chair, Kate. If you're okay um, with relinquishing, relinquished. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Pamela. Did you have your hand up? And I, I think I went on talking, and I think you had. Uh, sorry, sir. I was just going to give Pamela a chance if you did want to speak, Pamela, for a minute. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. I was just going to speak to the depth. When I first looked at the backyard as well, I did think it was a little uh, shallow, but the front is 22 meters. I think it's about 72 feet. And that in the backyard, there's 110 feet of just yard space. I don't know what the depth of the house is. So I don't know, um, you know what the standard might be for heritage homes but it still sounds like it is a decent sized lot. Um, but I do agree with you on the fence. Um, it is a bit of an eyesore. Thanks, Pamela. Um, Sarah? Thank you, Councillor Bothwell. I, I also, when I was reading the heritage impact assessment, also took note of the fence. And I do agree that if we could remove it, um, if if rest of the committee agrees to remove that from the recommendations, I would also support that. And in addition, I also had a, a question. Uh, it looks like so the, the lot are kind of, they're going to be custom homes, it seems like. Uh, and I was wondering, are we able to, um, to put in recommendations about uh, the buildings themselves and making sure that the, the homes that are built in that area do complement the heritage character of the Nixon Hall that will remain on, on the frontage on, on Main Street West just to, to you know, create a more holistic, um, the heritage character remains with the, the materials and the designs of the custom homes being built on the properties and new lots behind it, if that's possible. I uh, thank you. So Sarah, does it help that it says that detailed architectural drawings shall be submitted during the heritage permit application that efforts be made to ensure compatibility and distinguishability with the cultural heritage resource? Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. That does, that I'm sorry, it? I guess I missed that. Does I, that th cover it? That, that does, yes. I just, um, I guess I'm, I must have missed that specifics, but. Well, um, there's, I, only, there's only tw two pages and 20 recommendations, so <laughs> it's not. <laughs> uh, but yes, that would cover it again. It's just making sure that the design and the materials um, fit within the heritage character of, of the area. So if, if that's sufficient to the rest of the committee, then I'm also in agreement with that. Um, Bianca, are we going to see the materials? Are we going to, because I think in the past we haven't had sometimes, I think when it came to um, the railroad and whatever, we didn't necessarily, committee didn't necessarily get to comment on the materials that would be chosen. Can you just maybe clarify, it does say that in this recommendation that the drawings be submitted for the heritage permit application, which I'm assuming is coming to us. 
and efforts being made to ensure compatibility. Will we as committee have input into the, the materials for the uh, custom homes? Uh, thank you, Councilor Bothwell. Um, uh, for the railway, I remember us talking about some materials, but I, I don't know how in-depth it was. But for this one, definitely heritage permits are required, um, and we would like to see those drawings. And not only to ensure compatibility, but I really want to ensure distinguishability in that you're not having that blurred line. We want a very clear line. This is the heritage building, and these are the modern buildings, and there's no confusion uh, like is this an outhouse nothing like that so we want to make sure it's very clean and that's something that we can look at during the heritage permit and we can even have the option of having conditions within the heritage permit so there's still lots of opportunities to ensure that um, a best practice is being used and that efforts are being made to mediate any potential impacts thank you very much mayor jordan Thanks, uh, Chair Bothwell. I just I wanted to echo the fact of a couple of the committee members and yourself um, that the fence, the fence, in my opinion, should be removed by the developer. Um, knowing that fence, I know when it went up, and I know um, that most of the posts are uh, starting to rot, and um, <clears throat> it's only a matter of time um, before that fence is going to come down and and. I really think it, it it should be on the developer. Um, it it kind of looks like a wall, and, and the previous owners, when they put it up, he was building a wall. So uh, I know the history of it. So um, yeah, I, I really think it should be removed. And that's that's the main point I have. Thanks. Thank you, um, Bianca. I'm thinking that we'll reword the last, uh, based on the comments from the committee members, um, the last recommendation. So that it should read something like that the fence be removed as per the recommendations in the HIA and that um, just removed. Like I, I, I was going to say, and that a replacement be sympathetic to the uh, the existing picket white picket fence or something. What do you think? Oh, appropriate fence to address them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what do you think? Does that work? I was muted, sorry. Yes, I think so. I think um, that works. Okay, any committee members, do they think that works? I'm getting a mark. And do you think that works? I can only see a few. And Kate, okay. So we're, that will address the fence question. And the butternut tree that the construction plan mitigate any potential impacts to the large butternut tree to the west of the heritage resource and that the developer conduct genetic testing to determine the purity of the earth. Thank you. That addresses that perfectly. All right. Um, we can read this whole motion again, or we can let's let's leave it here for a moment and let's have the committee read this page. <laughs> I'll give you a second and then we'll move to the second page of the motion. Okay, you can move to the second page, Peter. So I'm gathering, Bianca, this is going to go to Committee of Adjustment for severance. Is that what's going to happen here? Uh, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, yes, I believe it will be going through Committee of Adjustment. Um, I don't have uh, the lead planner on the uh, uh, on the call right now. I can have him confirm that, but I believe it will be. Um, and um, these comments will be included within the, the report prepared by uh, planning staff. So if there's a concern by heritage that, like I mentioned, that I'm, I, I'd like to see the setback remain in the zoning bylaw, yet if it goes to committee adjustment for severance and they come up with five lots, what's the, sorry, maybe I'm, I don't know the timing because 
Can they go for the severance, get the five lots before we approve the zoning bylaw amendment for the MS-15? Um, I don't have the planner, uh, the lead planner with us on that. Um, let me just see. I think we actually do have Adam on the call. Just one second. Okay. Adam, can you hear me? Hi, Bianca. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, would you be able to speak to that for Councillor Bothwell? Uh, just the order of when, like, the severance, and if they get five lots in the severance, and when the zoning bylaw, which talks, speaks to the the lot size for the Main Street the house on Main. Yeah. So. I don't believe that it would actually be going through the Committee of Adjustment. It is a draft plan of subdivision, uh, so it would be going through draft plan approval. Okay, so it doesn't go, it's going to be strictly through the zoning bylaw amendment and through the draft plan of subdivision that the severances will be determined, correct? That's correct. Okay, gotcha. That makes sense, Adam. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Bianca. All right, so if everybody is good with the wording um, of the amended recommendation as it's been presented on the two screens, I'm going to ask for a mover and a seconder. I have a mover, Pamela, thank you. And a seconder for the recommendations. Kate, thank you, Kate. Um, so all in favor of the recommendations that were presented on the screen, that's carried. Thank you everyone for your work on that one. And thank you staff. I'm gonna move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the Grimsby Beach information report. And I believe I'll let staff speak to this. And then I think Kate had a motion that she circulated earlier to all committee members that she wishes to introduce as well, but I'll let staff speak to this first. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. I actually wanted to welcome, uh, we have Terry, our senior planner, and she will be doing the presentation on Grimsby Beach. And then I'll be giving you a little heritage focused um, uh, present, short presentation at the uh, following Terry. Thanks. Terry, I'm not sure if you're muted, but we can't right, see the yeah. full screen. We can see your notes. I don't know if you want to oh, go yeah. to the larger size. Oops. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. It's okay. Sorry. Having some technical difficulties here. Um, okay. Well, I'll, there we go. You can still see the notes or? Sorry. It's still loading on our end. Okay, okay can you wait? Can you see now? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you for um, allowing us to present on, on this. Uh, we, we, we sent a report to uh, committee and council, well, committee of the whole and council on November 15th, just to try to provide some of the process um, with some of the changes we had with uh, regard to the open house and public meeting we had originally scheduled for November 4th. So we just wanted to provide a, a little bit of an outline here. So there's, because there's a lot of components to this study, we just wanted to outline some of the, the key components. So there's a draft study report that has an overview of the report, report and the results of the work. And there's a, a number of suggestions in there for additional work beyond the study in pieces. Um, so there's there's the analysis of the storm sewers, there's the um, installation of signage, uh, establishment of a deeming bylaw, potential changes to the site plan control law, bylaw, and also the establishment of public realm master plan. So those are all separate and distinct after the study is complete. Then there is the draft secondary plan and, and implementing zoning. And that's where the focus of the some of the public meetings would, would really be looking at, looking at the um, the, the secondary plan policies as well as the implementing zoning. So that's what we're, we're going to be focused on for those. And that follows the Planning Act approval process. And um, this follows along with the, the requirement for the ICBL to have that, that that's why we have the ICBL to put those um, planning uh, policies in place. Uh, 
And it, through that secondary planning and zoning, it establishes the character areas and policies and regulations for them. So then there's another, uh, a number of other supporting documents to the study that include the draft urban design and heritage guidelines um, that provide guidelines for development. And that, that's something actually we're going to be sharing with you guys um, to, to have hopefully that you can um, take, take and review those specifically and provide comments to us. And as well as the draft fiscal impact statements and infrastructure considerations. And then there's a draft tree strategy as well that the um, community through the stakeholder advisory committee provided some um, input on as well. So that there's there's multiple pieces to, to this study. So we also outlined there's, there's a lot of confusion about the process. And when we were looking at the process, what was originally proposed in the RFP, it really was heavy on the front end where we were gathering a lot of feedback but not a lot there wasn't a lot of feedback on the the pieces and the resulting um work that was being done so we wanted to really move some of that back and that that's why some of the the steps for the public consultation summary we've moved that back so that comes after the um the open like the public meeting so we're, we're bringing it after those things rather than after the um public information center or public um open house so we're just trying to provide more opportunity for for people to really look at the documents and provide their feedback on the the actual documents that will will guide um growth and change or, um, or just even the protection of, of our heritage resources in the community over time. So that's really the focus of, of, of some of those changes. And as, as a result of some of the um, comments we received, but also our consultant having a unfortunate um, incident in her family, we, we had to uh, cancel the meeting on November 4th. And so we rescheduled it. So the open house, and we're gonna uh, repose it as a workshop on December 2nd with a public meeting tentatively scheduled for January 27th. So as you can see in this slide here, it, it will have that the open house workshop, which is next Thursday, is looking at the same materials that ha, ha, are existing. It's an informal workshop format where we'll really be going through the documents section by section saying, okay, this is what we have. This is what it's intended to do. Is what, what's wrong? How can we fix it? What, what were you like, what suggestions and changes should we make to it? And then we'll proceed with a public meeting. Um, after we revise the documents based on the feedback that we got at the webinar on October 27th, as well as the um, the open house on next week, and e uh, email comments as well, then we'll revise the documents and have them prepared for um, the tw January 27th public meeting. And then after that, based on any other further revisions, we'll have the recommendation report to council that we, we anticipate February, March um, in time for the expiry of the interim control bylaw that happens in, in May. So that, that's basically the layout of we're trying to really listen to the community of, of looking at improvements they want to make. That's that's where we're trying to go through these documents in an in informal way, especially with the open house workshop, so that we can make improvements to those documents and really try to to make sure that we're we're capturing what we need to capture and making sure they're they're improved. So I have a slide here as well, and I'll ask Bianca to speak to it about some of the um, heritage provisions in those documents. Bianca. Thank you, Terry. Um, so I just prepared this little slide here, uh, which focused on the um, heritage protections within the proposed uh, secondary plan and how that's going to um, work with our parallel strategy that we have been working very hard on. Um, so please see the proposed policies on the screen uh, in relation to the cultural heritage within the Grimsby Beach community. Um, Please do share any comments you have with us via email or at the open helps as well on these policies. We are uh, very much open to hearing them. Uh, we understand that there is a recommendation um, that will be discussed this evening in relation to a heritage conservation district study in the beach. And we wanted to provide some comment on this prior to the committee's consideration. Uh, staff feel confident that the policies on the screen provide the protection required within the Grimsby Beach area when, pa when paired with a proactive concurrent strategy, which includes over 200 culturally um, significant properties being under review. Uh, this proactive uh, approach is being undertake undertaken by heritage and planning staff, 
and it will provide uh, demolition control to heritage resources after the interim control bylaw is lifted. And with this new proposed secondary plan, heritage impact assessments can be requested for proposed works on registered properties, and then on properties adjacent to those registered properties, and then properties with status under the Ontario Heritage Act, particularly part four. Um, so part, so just to reiterate, that's um, section 27, which is your municipal heritage register, and then part four, which is our individual designations. These will require heritage impact assessments, or we can request them, um, and then adjacent, uh, adjacent properties to either of these. Um, we can also ask for a heritage impact assessment. We have also proposed urban design guidelines and heritage guidelines that will be used as a guide for all future change to once again, these protected sites and then the adjacent sites. Um, and also all properties included within the secondary plan. Uh, these, with these protections in place, we can ensure both the historical and the cultural value is being preserved. This approach creates the desirable balance between heritage protection and artistic creativity, which has been identified as the cultural value of the community. This entire study has been created as a direct response to community feedback. Thank you. I'll pass this back to Councillor Bothwell. Thank you, Bianca and Terry, uh, for your presentations. Um, I'm just going to ask Peter if, um, following this meeting, we can upload some of the presentations we're not including the agenda materials that were pr uh, provided to the committee tonight, and it'd be great to have those uh, attached and appended to the existing agenda. So the ones that were just presented now, and I think some of the other delegations also had uh, presentations that were um, are, are not in the agenda. So if they could be included, that would be much appreciated. Um, do I have, do we have any questions from the committee uh, with respect to the report that was just presented, um, the information report? And then I'll uh, ask Kate, go ahead, Kate. I just have a comment of about some of these um, heritage protections that are supposed to be in this, is this plan. Um, 200 um, properties are being evaluated right now, basically all our homes, um, to be placed on that do not demolish list kind of thing where they give the um, uh, planning staff, um, um, I think it's 60 days, is it changed to 90 days, 60 to 90 days to determine if these houses are worth saving or not. Um, that's what everybody in this town, like all the place, all the homes we put on this do not, this, this uh, list, have that same protection. And, and they're going to also encourage us to designate as many of these homes, these cottages, if they qualify um, to, um, and that's something that, they, that Bianca mentioned will be one of the heritage protections. That is a heritage protection that is, a, is available to anybody in this town. Nothing, nothing additional. Um, uh, and so also in the urban design guides lines for new bills, the way I interpret it is that it's along the same party line as what they've mentioned in other builds where with the Nixon Hall, they want the houses, the new builds to look different, not necessarily looking historic. They want the new buildings with the new building behind the Mountain Street, um, uh, con the big apartment build to look different. And so um, slowly over time, with new development, slowly the beach will change. And you see, if we take a step back to the 200 lists that they, uh, the list of 200 homes that they're currently assessing, if their value is there, the value for Grimsby Beach is different. There's a lot of beautiful homes in this town that would stand up against a list of if they're, if they're valuable, but you see, a lot of our homes were made of wood over a hundred years ago. And it, our history went through a lot of evolution and part of that evolution and part of the story that a lot of people don't tell about Grimsby Beach is the story of our poverty and our time when the homes went into disrepair and vanished underneath vinyl siding and old boards and, and, and gingerbread hidden behind. And 
it was lost, it was gone, it didn't remain here. And over time, many of these houses could easily be torn down. But it takes a certain kind of person to take these houses and say, absolutely, I could get this house demoed in a heartbeat. I read you right now, most of these houses on this on this list could easily be, if you pull down my soffits from my cottage here, you're gonna find a, the that somebody probably 40 years ago mended it with a, a water waterbed frame. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and and so the value of the houses individually are important, but the value of the community and what and the evolving history and the history starting starting back during the 1840s, I, forget the 1840s, we're talking about the Empire Loyalists coming here and the Boleslaw family and then giving it in the 1840s or loaning it to the 1840s for the Chautauqua movement and the Methodist, the meeting with the temperance. Like it's, I, I made notes about the history and, and most people, when you hear, when you hear about Grimm's Beach and you hear that, that the Chautauqua movement in the, in the, in the United States was in the 1874, but, but Grimsby Beach started the first Chautauqua like years and years before, starting really in the 1840s and moving forward, but most people don't know what that means. Like, it's great that we were the first in Canada. We predated the American one, Chautauqua, but what the heck does that mean, right? Because what does a Chautauqua mean? But Chautauqua is, it's a, a valuable part of history where they started looking at the middle class and they started looking at seeing value in educating them and giving the, and exposing them to arts and culture and higher thinking and civic responsibility ideas like it was a massive movement and we started it here in canada and they followed us in the states but it started in grimsby beach it is a massive amazing important part of our history and it's our history Grimsby Beach's history and the thing is it started and it, it it started so long ago that these houses these houses need love to be brought back I uh, we have been posting on our Grimsby Beach site pictures of houses 20 years ago some 20 years ago that don't look at all what we have right now they look like poverty stricken homes. There's no gingerbread on them. There's no trace of history at all. People came here from 40 to 20 years ago and started peeling away these layers. And they started seeing shadows of gingerbread. They started recreating, they started putting twists on them and they started bringing back this heritage. Bus loads of people come here every week that we're not harnessing, that our local BIA is not harnessing. That could be building and supporting economies in the downtown core if we could just organize this a little bit and bring these buses to the downtown core we could be utilizing grimsey beach if we lay the foundation to protect it but this do not demolish will fail this this 200 homes that are being put in place as a protection we're going to fail we're going to fail it because you're going to peel away my soffits and you're going to see that the the, the waterbed mattress is building my soffits and you're going to say and you're going to peel away and you're my drop my drywall and you're going to see that somebody at one point who didn't have drywall in their house when they built these houses took the scraps from the burned out cottages and piled all the batten boards or the battens up instead of putting a two by four in there to hold drywall and the thing is you might say well why the heck are you thinking about protecting it but it is a massive, massive, massively important part of our history in this country, in our province, in our, in our town. And it wasn't only that history, it changed and evolved over the years. And if you ask anybody who ever lived here, it's magical, something's magical and it's worth saving. But this two, 200 lists on the do, on this demolished list, this, this, this inventory, it just gives the town 60 some odd days to say, does this house have a lot of merit? Like, is it strong enough to, 
to, is it valuable enough? And the average person would say no. The average person would say no, but not those people that took those cottages across from Bell Park some 25, 30 years ago and started bringing them back that they were not there. They were not there, it was all hidden. They, didn't, they saw that there was value, but the average person looking at Grimsby Beach right now, after we have started bringing this beach back, after the residents have slugged and, and brought it back, those people have money and they don't wanna live in these little cottages. They don't wanna save these cottages. They don't see the value necessarily in these cottages. And more and more of these houses will, that are on this, this list will be easily removed from this list. And the thing is, our history, we have two houses that are designated at Grimsby Beach, just two, just two. And I wonder if some of these cottages would pass, would they be like, if we, if we ask for them all to be designated, could they be designated? And it, it's not, Grimsby Beach is not individual homes only. It's a compilation of many things. It's a compilation even of the history of poverty here. It is important. It has all been important. And I really feel that, um, that these, these protections that they have placed here are not valid. And in 2016, the, the planning staff of this town approached Grimsby Beach residents in February of 2016, and they said to us, you guys don't have any protections over there to save your homes. You need to have a heritage study. They gave us two options, two heritage study options. And they said, you need to pick one of these studies because, because development pressure is coming and you don't have any protections currently to protect your homes. They stressed it, the planning staff stressed it. And they encouraged us to start um, a community meeting, a group of people that would try to work with the town staff to explain what that all meant and how we would go about it. And I'm just going to ask you to get your points as concisely as you can. Here. Okay. Okay. My point, I'm going to, I'm going to summarize this. They proposed heritage studies to us. We created groups, Like this process has been a long process for us. It started in 2016. This is not, and it took a long time for our residents to trust planning staff. They proposed heritage study and the HCD, that's what they proposed to us. And it took us a long time to go through the process to convince the neighbors to trust our town and to trust that we would have a voice and that if we didn't like what they proposed, that we could say, we could, we could raise our voices and they would listen to us. And then we went through a long process that ended in the committee that we formed going around and getting 70, 76 signatures of people in the core that said, yeah, we want a heritage study now. And we got those signatures in 2019 and we brought them to heritage and we move forward as a strategic priority as this town to have a heritage study. And for months and months, it went through that we were going to impact the terms of reference, the heritage community. We, the town actually promised the residents of Grimsby Beach that they would be able to impact the heritage terms of reference, but they didn't. And they promised the heritage committee that they would be able to impact the terms of reference. And we asked every single meeting until we noticed that it was, and we were, and the last meeting that I asked, I was told by Heritage or by the planning staff that, that they were bottlenecked, that they just couldn't get it done. It wasn't close to being done. They needed more time and they'd get it to us. So we could impact these terms of reference. But just days later, days after that statement was made, it was presented to the planning committee as a land use study, a land use study, not the heritage study that they proposed to us that we worked years through to convince a community to do. They presented a land use study that has very limited resources in place to protect a heritage community. And so- Let's shorten it up, Kate. Okay. So my concern is I I've would- got, I've got your motion here. So I, would like, as well. okay. I would like to move forward to present a motion. I do believe that this process was important to protect this community, but 
we proposed a heritage commit a, a, a heritage study for the to this area to protect the heritage. And this planning, this 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 land use study has very limited resources to protect us. All the same resources that the rest of the town has. But this is an asset, and I strongly believe that we need to do what we told our town residents we were going to do and they, what we told them that they needed okay. and move forward yeah. that way. Well, do you want your motion on the floor to be discussed? I'd love my motion on the floor to be discussed. Okay, so um, you're moving this motion. I'm gonna read your motion and then you're gonna need a seconder and then we can go into further discussion on it, okay? okay. Um, Bianca, did you just wanna clarify something on the point that was made? I would. Um... I, I really do want to uh, correct some misinformation um, that was shared. In 2016, yes, there was a meeting um, that discussed potential options um, and that included a culture heritage landscape and a heritage conservation district study. And that is why we came before the committee. The committee decided they wanted to move forward with a CHL. And when it was brought before council, council made the decision to do a land use planning study. It was not staff. It was council decision. Council dis directed staff to conduct a land use planning study for the area. During this evaluation of the study, it was identified that there is different types of value within this community. So there's heritage value, and then there's a cultural value, okay? So cultural value cannot necessarily be protected by heritage protections. So for example, you have historic fabric. There is best practices, industry best practices that apply to that historic fabric. So in order to do these things that apply, that includes not blurring the lines so that when a heritage professional comes on site, they can clearly see where the historic fabric is and where the modern fabric is. So in this community, there's a lot of use of gingerbread and these ornate pieces, this artistic creativity. All of that is valued. It is important to the community and that is considered a cultural value. But when you put heritage protections to control cultural value, it's not, you're not going to have that creative freedom. And now you're going to have a different type of rule that says that's supposed to be a historic building, then let's not blur the lines. So then you can't encourage the use of Victorian style gingerbread because it reads as a historic gingerbread. So when someone comes on site, they don't have the same knowledge as a professional to go and see grains, to see the pattern and know that that's not authentic. So it reads as something that is claiming to be heritage, but really it was added more modernly. Now that has been identified as a cultural value to the community. So that is why you can't have a heritage conservation district to protect cultural value. And that's why we've put in place this secondary plan and these mechanisms, because Kate, I understand your points about this value of the Methodist campground. And I myself see how much, how so we're so lucky to have such a unique uh, history in that area. And we're so lucky to have that much inventory and all the things you're mentioning are that associative and contextual value that holds so much weight. And that's why putting these all on the register, we're identifying, identifying identifying where our resources are and we're providing protection to those resources. Even if we had a heritage conservation district, we would have to provide protection to individual ones to show their strength through part four, which is recommended. So even though you have that HCD, there are still holes. And in order to get concurrence from all property owners, you're going to end up with watered down policies. So you still need to do the individual designation to provide them the protection that the, it needs. So you're potentially losing that ability to have that creative freedom, that artistic value that was identified. And then at the same time, your resources still could end up being watered down because you you, depending on how stringent you get with your policies, you're likely still going to want to do individual designations. So that's why we've gone with the secondary plan. This secondary plan is an overlay in our official plan, which literally shows this is a special character area that needs special policies to ensure its retention. So that's why we've gone down this route. And the community has said we did um, multiple engagement 
and nowhere did people say an overwhelming, we want an HCD because they recognize that cultural value. And when you have that cultural value, you can't enforce it through heritage protections. You can't say, this is a historic building, I wanna hang things on it. There's protections in place that's to ensure that fabric and that integrity is being preserved. So that's why we have that blurred line. And that's why the secondary plan paired with these different layers of protection, which are mandated by an act that actually carry protections. They're, they're there for a reason. And yes, we have 60 days, but we have a lot of contextual and associative value associated with these buildings. And I hope that I can, I have explained to you why an HCD would almost affect the ability to have your cultural value. Thanks, Bianca. Um, can, I, can I speak to, yep. to one of the Go comments that Bianca's made? Quickly, Kate, okay, quickly. Okay. So, um, so we were assured by the planning staff at the time that we could have a flexible um, HCD, that we could protect mainly what could be built, what could be torn down, and they'll still allow for the creative um, the creative design that's been going on for years at Grimsby Beach. And I'd like to add something else about saying that staff did not advise. And potentially, I wasn't in closed door meetings, but I was in a heritage meeting. And I did ask Walter, I said, why, 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 why did this happen? Because this is not what I've just spent all these years with my town, my community, um, working with them to move towards. And just days ago, you said something else. And, and he said, not in a closed door meeting, that, that the town was advised to move forward with a land use study instead of an HCD because it would protect them from being sued by 33 Victoria Terrace. And I would hate, I would hate that we would sacrifice this historic community to not be sued because we did stuff wrong in a yeah. pr procedure. And that's my concern. And that I think is why really we moved forward with a land use study and why maybe council voted for it. Thanks Kate. Bianca, did you want a quick uh, statement back? I would just like to clarify the ultimate council direction is to do a land use planning study. And so that's the direction staff took. Um, I also wanted to know what I forgot to mention previously that the committee did provide comments and um, we do have emails from the committee with those comments. And that included um, Kate and other members of the committee. And um, one of the points made within those comments was that um, the protections be um, not as stringent. So just to speak to that, that stringent, that's a watered down policy. So that's where we still need to have part four designations. And I wanted to note that part and then stress again, this is the council direction. So we have done exactly that. Thank you. So, um, Pamela, I was going to go move to read the motion from Kate. Um, did you have a quick comment you wanted to make? Thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, I wanted to make a comment to the motion, actually, before it's read. Actually, I find the wording of the motion. You you, sorry, Pamela, you can't speak to the motion until I read it. Okay. So let me read it, and then we can we can all speak to it. So I've got a mover, with which is Kate. Um, I need a seconder and I'll read the motion. If I can have a seconder to read the motion. Uh, thanks, Anne. So the motion is, whereas Grimsby Beach Tatagua is a valuable heritage asset worth saving with roots back to 1846, it is of provincial and national significance as it predates the popular American Tatagua movement of higher learning starting in 1874. Whereas part five of the Ontario Heritage Act enables the council of a municipality to designate an entire municipality or any defined area or areas of the municipality as a heritage conservation district, whereas our town's official plan clearly states in multiple locations that recognition, enhancement, and protection of the special character of Grimsby Beach is a priority for the town, whereas in council strategic priorities for 2019 to 2022, it prioritizes protecting the heritage and physical character of Grimsby Beach through the preservation of existing homes and innovative solutions for tent lots, whereas investing in the preservation and rehabilitation of existing heritage cottages and cultural attributes could benefit local businesses and our town through increased tourism, 
whereas the current land use study and secondary plan does not offer substantial protection to existing cottages or the special character in historic Grimsby Beach, whereas on Monday, February 29, 2016, the Grand Beach Avenue Hall, the town's planning staff clearly explained that to protect Grimsby Beach heritage, we should consider the two options of heritage conservation districts and community improvement plans, whereas town planning staff continued to update the Heritage Advisory Committee of positive feedback from residents to continue towards HDD or CIP as noted, in many monthly minutes of the Heritage Advisory Committee meetings, it was noted that the feedback coming in has all been positive and there appears to be an interest in forming a stakeholders group to explore the creation of an HCD or CIP for Grimsby Beach until disbanding the committee in September of 2016. Whereas in the summer of 2019, 77 residents of the Grimsby Beach core area signed a petition to present to the Heritage Advisory Committee of their wishes to move forward with the heritage study. Therefore, be it resolved that at the November 23rd, 2021 meeting of the Town of Grimsby Heritage Advisory Committee, Regarding protecting cultural heritage resources of historic Grimsby Beach, we request the council's consideration of a heritage conservation district study in the next 2022 budget. So that's been moved and seconded in discussion. Pamela, go ahead. Thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, I'm surprised at the wording of the motion coming forward. In our terms of reference, it clearly states we are here as committee members. And we are here to support our professionals in their capacity. We are not professionals. And the wording in this undermines the credentials of those professionals. I, I find it somewhat inappropriate. And I think to speak to the fact that um, there's a suggestion that the beach uh, area isn't important to staff, I find highly inappropriate. And I, I have to look at the amount that's been put into this in terms of cost and in terms of staff's time, not to mention um, 200 homes um, have been under an ICBL for quite a while and it doesn't end till May. It, it, I, I think this is a conversation that should have been a conversation, and I don't think it should have come to this committee in this capacity, and I do find it inappropriate, and I, I don't appreciate the fact, and I won't support it, because I think it goes against what we're here for as a committee, and that is to support our staff, and it's not to tear them down and this is what that does, and I will not support it. I think it's inappropriate. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela. Is there any other comments with respect to the, the motion from committee members first? Antonetta, did you want to speak to it? Thank you, through you, Chair. I think, you know, as a staff team, we're struggling because Kate was, you know, and not to point out, but Heritage selected Kate to be on the, the Stakeholder Advisory Committee. And we've been going through this process very transparently with frequent meetings. And we didn't hear an, HC, an HCD come up as the solution. So, and we, of course, we engaged all the community and we have all the community engagement that backs that up. But perhaps more importantly is, I think you have dedicated staff that care deeply about the heritage of this community and are doing everything and are following through with council decisions and doing our best to even go above and beyond them to deliver even better heritage protection. And I, and I want us to think about when there's media out there or when we're speaking like this, the reputational harm and the impact to the staff and how hurtful this is, I think, to their professional designations, to their ability to do good work in the field, but also to their ability to show up to work in, in a way that they feel positive about hearing, being here and that they're contributing to the well-being of this community and the preservation of heritage. In the last 14 months, we have listed and designated more properties than in the last decade. And I still think there's questions around the intentions of staff. And I, I just have to speak on behalf of like the team here that this is hurtful and it's not helpful. We're here to help the community. If there are heritage comments to the secondary plan, if we want to beef those up, we welcome all of that. Please bring your comments forward. Attend the open house, attend the public meeting, write us an email. We'll do everything we can to uh, include that and to work with the consultants to continue to, to beef it up to a point where you feel that we're adequately acknowledging and protecting the heritage. But look, I think let's work together. And, and I, I think moves like this only 
uh, cause friction instead of uniting us towards the common goal, which is why we're here to serve this community towards protecting its heritage. So I just want us to be uh, really aware of the harm that this causes the team who's been working on this. Thank you. Thanks, Antonetta. And um, I, I hear where you're coming from. I, I see I see the motion before me with, I'm looking to see if there's anything that's not factual or that um, might um, might be might be against um, staff, but I, I'm seeing some factual items here with respect to uh, previous meetings and conversations and, and a direction that Kate seems to be, um, uh, which which any member of the committee has the ability to do or any member of the community has the building to do, ability to do is to bring a motion requesting uh, a, a heritage study be done. So um, for whatever you know, uh, we're not to we're not going to question the motives. Um, whatever, but the motion before us is looking at an alternate to the recommendation and the report before us tonight, the information report, which um, again is with respect to the land use study for Grimsby Beach. And this is requesting that the committee uh, consider um, a heritage conservation district study as a budget consideration by council. Um, and, I, and we know that the land use study and the secondary plan are progressing um, side by side as it is anyway through the process that um, staff have identified in the report. Um, is there any other comments to the motion that um, Kate has brought forward um, that's on the floor right now? Because then what we're going to do is a vote on, on the motion. Um, and then if it, if it does go through, it would be brought to council for their consideration. Mark, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Bartholomew. Um, I'm new to this, so I, I, you probably notice I'm sitting back a lot and just kind of drinking this in and listening. And and I live in Grimsey Beach, um, so I I think one of the things, Bianca, thank you very much um, for your passionate explanation. And the reason I say passionate explanation is uh, I learned something tonight about uh, con I know, uh, heritage versus culture. Right, and and I mean, you you have a, um, a degree or a designation that that means you have studied this and, and you understand the difference, and and I get it. Uh, I I live down the street from Kate, and and I and I understand where Kate's coming from too, and, and a lot of our neighbors. And I think what I'd like to focus on is is uh, one comment you made was some misinformation. This is an opportunity is how I'm looking at this where we have a workshop coming up right in, in a week. Let's let's as a team, uh, you know, back again to Antonetta's comments, let's as a team focus on making sure that the folks and, and Kate and, and I are both part of the advisory committee for, for the, the, the beach, that folks really clearly understand the difference between the two, because clearly it, it, it isn't always what's there, right? And, and I think the intentions are excellent and I support it. And, and I, I, um, I would support however I can help um, to make sure that this message gets out. Uh, we do a lot of walking up and down the beach, literally to talk to people and say, please come to these meetings, please fill out these surveys, please go to the town website. And I think your numbers that, that I've seen in, in a lot of the metrics are good. It shows that people are in fact responding. So um, I, I think this is a chance, an olive branch, if you will, uh, for us to really focus on, okay, so why, how can we do this? I can't speak to the past because I didn't live here. But what I can, what I can speak to is people are, are frustrated on both sides. Clearly, I see that. Let's use this opportunity for the open house to try and drive this out to, to a better understanding. And that, that, that's my offer and I'll help however I can. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, that's all I, I'll, I'll, I'll just stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, Pamela, did you have something else? Your hand is still up. Or was that Thank just- Councillor Bothwell. No, I did, um, with the open house coming up, I do think it's the perfect opportunity to clarify a lot of these issues. And I, I think this motion is premature. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ann, go ahead. Yeah, I wonder if we could maybe talk about portions of it and maybe take out some of the portions regarding the past out of it um, and talk about, you know, the idea of the Heritage Conservation District study separately. 
Okay, so um, Kate, this is where you and Anne can look at, can we, uh, Anne can ask to amend your motion, uh, friendly amendment, and uh, we can remove some sections and refine it down to just a few key paragraphs if you want. Certainly. I put those all in there so that people would realize the history of how we got from being offered a heritage study and receiving mm -hmm. something that wasn't because for me, this is a huge part of this is community trust. And, um, and we were advised by professional planning staff of the time for one thing. And, and there's a change in, in the way we, in the path that we went down. Um, that's not to discredit people, but we, my, the reason I put that in there was because okay. people don't understand yep. why we changed. What would you like, uh, Anne, what are you suggesting we remove and um, as a friendly amendment? Yeah, I was, um, you know, uh, I would like to focus on the hair. I've just I've got a copy of my phone of the the Heritage Conservation District as being part of, um, uh, as being put under consideration by Town Council in the 2022 budget. I would like to include that part. Um, I don't know how much of the previous looking at it right now. Um, it's not in front of me. It would be needed. Um, okay. Um, so like the therefore part at the end, mm -hmm. um, if we could figure out a way to reward that. Okay. Um, so um, one paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three, paragraph four. Maybe uh, if we keep paragraph one and um, as some of the background. Yeah. Um, where's paragraph? Where's part five of the Ontario Heritage Act enables? Yeah, yeah, that part. Keep that, and then maybe jump all the way down, then skip the center part. Um, and then where's in the summer of 2019, 77 residents of the Grimsby Beach, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down through the end. Okay. What about um, the town's official plan and the strategic priorities? Yes. Those, yes. Leave, yes. Leave those in. Council. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think that would be plenty. And I think that would get us where we need to go and talking about this as just getting the conversation going again. Okay. So Kate, yes, the, the, Kate the friendly amendment is to, um, to include just paragraphs one to four, which is the, whereas Grimley Beach to Tagua and the second one. Just a quick question. Sorry. Sorry, you froze, you froze there for a bit. Sorry. Sorry, you froze there for a oh. bit. Um, so the, the, the first four paragraphs, so the whereas Grimsby Beach to Tagua, the first one, the second paragraph, whereas part five of the Ontario Heritage Act, third paragraph, whereas our town's official plan clearly states, and then the fourth paragraph, whereas in council strategic priorities, and then we're going to jump down to whereas in the summer of 2019, 77 residents, that paragraph, and then ending with the therefore be it resolved that okay. a thing, um, regarding protecting cultural heritage, we request council's consideration. Are you good with those that amendment, um, Kate? I am good with it. Can I ask a question before we vote on it? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Am I correct to um, understand that um, with the Main Street study that we are undergoing right now, that we are um, simultaneously doing um, a secondary plan and a HCD study at the same time? Uh, if Antoinette or Terry can comment on that one, or Bianca. Uh, yeah, um, sorry, yeah, uh, we are um, finalizing the RFP for the secondary plan um, for the HCDs, uh, well, the Main Street East uh, area as well. Um, often what, what we've seen is that HCDs involve some type of secondary plan because they, they each touch, touch on some different issues. That, um, that that work together. So um, they each have some design guidelines and other things like that that, that touch on each other. So they, they do, they can work together. So it would be, is it a standard thing that you might run an HCD and a secondary plan together? Um, well, one of the things that you usually do is, is you have, you stagger them um, a little bit. So it might be, we're, we're going to have to work to, to make sure that they align really well 
um, to make sure that all the considerations and um, public consultation in one process aligns with the other process. Um, and so that, that will be a, a constant effort that we have. Um, in, in this case, because we are with this far in the process, and if there is an area that, um, that, that in the end, um, the committee or community feels that there is still a need for an HCD, that could be something that, um, that, that you guys want to explore further of like scoping it and seeing what exactly you want to include in an HCD. Um, and just to point out some of the, the things you were mentioning about some of the stories and that cultural heritage, some of those are not planning related things that we can really help with. Some of those are, are more um, other parts of cultural uh, heritage and, and, and awareness that, that the stories can be like in, on um, in parks and stuff like that. Like, so we can tell the stories in multiple ways that, that wouldn't necessarily go into a planning document or even a designation. So there's lots of ways the community can really bring about the stories of community that, that might not be relevant for that document. It doesn't mean it's not a good idea and it, it's something that, that can be considered. One of the, the things I mentioned is that there's a, a public, um, uh, there's a master plan um, just talked about for, for public lands. So, so maybe that can be explored in there further as well. So there's, there's as I was saying, there's additional component parts to the work that is being suggested that, that might all be, also be a consideration for some of those stories that you were talking about. In the current, so you went, you froze there for a minute. Oh, so, sorry. If so, I've noticed in this process through the study, there doesn't seem to be a lot of, of opportunity to capture our, our assets of Grimsby Beach as in like, like stories, the history, the, the fountain, the urns, the, it doesn't seem to be, it seems to be per not necessarily heritage. So does, is that why it would make sense? And is that why we are, doing that with Main Street East, we are running two studies simultaneously. Sorry, I, maybe I cut out. I'm not sure who's cutting out. I, I heard only part of that. Yeah, we're both cutting out here. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm just, I just, like I, I, that's what I feel is missing with a land use study of a historic community is that it, its focus doesn't necessarily seem to be on a lot of heritage where it doesn't, it, like we are not talking about those stories. We're not talking about, hey, look at that historic fountain designated to a woman in 1928. Look at these urns. We're not, we're not, uh, we don't seem to be discussing any of this with this secondary, this land use study. And I'm wondering, is, is that what uh, incorporating or running a simultaneous heritage HCD study at the same time, like we're right now proposing, I assume, with Main Street East, is that what will that will that capture that kind of story? Is that what you're saying? Oh, you cut out, so I didn't get what you were saying. 100%. Sorry, through the chair. I think there's there's yet another process. It, that's that's more of some of the cultural heritage that, that can be explored through other tools in addition to some of the planning tools. So there's 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 multiple ways that a community can really showcase that. The museums do it. Our libraries do it. Like our websites. Do it. There's multiple ways that are beyond some of these planning tools that we're talking about. I'm, I'm just wondering is that what gets captured is the, do the heritage study, is that what it will focus on, the heritage aspect? Mm. That's what I'm trying to understand. Okay, so uh, Terry is freezing again. Um, you're freezing, going back and forth between freezing there. So I think it's just the question is, you just wanna ask it one more time, please, Kate. Just trying to, I'm just trying to mention that right now with the Main Street East studies that we're we're running the secondary plan at the same time in conjunction with an HCD. And I'm wondering, are we doing that because we've got a planning study that focuses on land use and not so much on a, of a historic community? And there's value in capturing the stories and the heritage value of things that it doesn't seem to be part of this study so far and we're near the end of it. I mean, is that where the value might be added if we do incorporate this historic? It's freezing again. Through you, Chair Bothell, I think it's key. That's as per but recommendation of our original planning staff. Yeah. yeah. So so I think, I think Terry and, and Kate, I think um, 
yeah, what you're saying is, you know, is there value in doing an HCD in combination with the land use study for Grimsby Beach, similar to what we're doing with Main Street, which we're doing yes. both to capture the heritage aspects, yes. right? Is that yes. simply a question? So I guess that's a yes or no answer. <laughs> I, I think there, there's, this is Beach. beyond, especially because yes, that's where we started. Through you, Chair Bothwell, if I could, yep. you know, it's easy, I think, to say yes, but it's not necessarily the case because the kind of heritage that Kate is talking about is that intangible heritage, uh, the oral history, the, the poverty, the kind of pieces that designation and heritage permits given to you through a heritage conservation district where you have to apply for a permit for change doesn't really capture it. I think there's other tools that we can use. So whether it's a, a, a strategy of commemorating the history of Grimsby Beach through plaques, Terry said maybe uh, something joint with a museum, website presence, a walking tour of Grimsby Beach. I think there's a variety of facets that we can explore. And if that's something that the community feels strongly about, let's explore those. Let's bring those comments forward and let's drive a solution. I think just very similar to the trees. The community said something about the trees. So now there's a tree strategy being put forward. So if, if that's the sentiment of the community, we're not capturing some of that cultural value and that heritage um, and the, the, the depth of history of Grimsby Beach through a land use process, then let's figure out a meaningful way that resonates with the community to do that. And it could be through a series of, of tools, not just one tool. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, Pamela, if you have a quick other statement to make here. Thank you. Um, my understanding would have been that there would have been ample opportunity to come forward with things that were of significance to the community. For the HCD uh, meeting that we had for Main Street East, um, when we met, um, we were asked if we had any stories to come forward with that we could. So. I'm kind of concerned that we're getting, you know, so many months into this, I think it's been a year, if not more, and then all of a sudden it seems like uh, there's a, a question as to what the direction is. Um, and if people have been on this committee, I would think they would be clear as to what the direction is. So I'm a little concerned how we got to the point where people are unhappy um, with the process when it's this far in. Okay, thanks, uh, Pamela. Um, I'm gonna go to the motion. Uh, we've had a mover and a seconder. Uh, if there's no further questions. Um, and then we're gonna read it. And um, I think I'm gonna do a recorded vote, Peter, on the, uh, on the motion. So uh, moved by Kate, seconded by Anne. Um, so first of all, that resolve that uh, the Grimsby Beach Land Use Study Process and Draft Secondary Plan be received for information. Uh, and I don't know, Peter, how you want to word these two motions. We were going to combine them and then move into Kate's, which is um, how would you suggest I do this with the amended uh, wording for Kate's and incorporate the receiving of the report? Thank you. Through you, Councillor Locke. Well, I, I think I would recommend um, having the first motion, so Kate's motion as an amendment. We could deal with that first. If it gets approved, then we'll deal with the original motion as amended. So that would be to receive the report and then uh, Kate's amendment will be included in it as well. So we'll deal with the amendment first and then the main motion as amended. Okay. So then the main motion, the, the amended motion in front of us is Kate's, Kate's motion, which is um, whereas Grimsby Beach Tatagua is a valuable heritage asset worth saving with roots back to 1846, it is of provincial and national significance as it predates the popular American Chautauqua movement of higher learning starting since 1874, whereas part five of the Ontario Heritage Act enables the Council of the Municipality to designate the entire municipality or any defined area or areas of the municipality as a heritage conservation district, HCD, whereas our town's official plan clearly states States and multiple locations that recognition, enhancement, and protection of the special character of Grimsby Beach is a priority for the town. Whereas in council strategic priorities for 2019-22, it prioritizes protecting the heritage and physical character of Grimsby Beach through the preservation of existing homes and innovative solutions for tent lots. Whereas in the summer of 2019, 77 residents of the Grimsby Beach Corps signed a petition to present to the Heritage Advisory Committee of their wishes to move forward with a heritage study. Therefore, be it resolved that at the November 23rd, 2021 meeting of the Grimsby, Town of Grimsby Heritage Advisory Committee, 
regarding protecting cultural heritage resource of historic Grimsby Beach, we request the council's consideration of a heritage conservation district study in the next 2022 budget. Um, and I'm gonna do recorded vote, please. <coughs> Peter, if you could do that. And so for the new members, I'll call your name and if you could just indicate whether you support the motion. So you can just indicate yes, or if you don't, you'll just say no. Emil? No. Sarah? No. Mark? Yes. Kate? Yes. Anne? Yes. Mayor Jordan? Yes. Councilor Bothwell? And I'm a yes. That is approved. That's carried. Okay, so thank you. So that we're gonna move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the verbal update in Indigenous history. Pamela, you're gonna give us a, um, uh, do you have a presentation or a brief update? I have uh, just a brief update. Thank you, Councillor Bothwell. So I had sent uh, Councillor Bothwell an email on the plaque that's in Centennial Park on um, in reference to the neutrals burial site. And I just wanted to give a bit of background first. The neutral indigenous people um, occupied the area of Western Lake Ontario before 1650, originally called Atawandarans. They were renamed neutral by the French in the mid 1600s for being traders more than fighters and remaining neutral between the Iroquois of what is now New York State and the Hurons to the north of Niagara. Little is known about the neutrals other than some archaeological findings and mentions in writings from early French missionaries. It is presumed that the neutrals were likely massacred or expelled around 1650 by the Iroquois. In October 1976, a town employee discovered a human skull, French axes, conch shells, and copper kettles near Centennial Park on what was a new construction site located to the west of the park. The employee contacted the former stone sh shop owner who recommended the Royal Ontario Museum be contacted. Archaeologists Walter Kenyon and his staff began excavation on the site. Walter Kenyon was also the curator of the ROM at the time. The dig took six months. At its completion, the site revealed over 373 individuals were interned there and the range of dates of these graves were over thir a 30 year period, each one consisting of a span of 10 years. It is noted by Walter Kenyon that different colored European beads were found in the graves, which uh, assisted in determining a span of dates. During the dig, Walter Kenyon was placed under citizen's arrest by the Union of the Ontario Indigenous for failing to comply with provisions of the Cemeteries Act. Walter Kenyon was later fined 100 for digging without a permit and the supervision of the Ontario Medical Officer of Health. The site remained closed for two months as politicians, Indigenous leaders and archaeological crew worked to reach an agreement. Eventually, it was decided the bodies would be reinterned in Centennial Park in a mass plot lined with moose height. 400 artifacts from the burial site were put in the care of the ROM, periodically put on display in Grimsby. Today, a provincial plaque recognizes the park's history as an Indigenous burial site. However, I'm asking that the language on this plaque be updated as it is out of date and it is very insensitive. I would also like to have an Indigenous, uh, have Indigenous consultation on the plaque so we may see how they would like to see their her heritage presented to the community. And I, I also feel this would be significant for our community in utilizing it in engagement with the community um, and learning from the neutrals, uh, seeing what we could learn more from them, um, from other uh, Indigenous people and in that um, that we could reach out to. 
Um, the plaque, um, I believe we would have to go as well. Um, the government would have to approve it. And then also to consider who pays for the plaque to be redone. So thank you. Um, Bianca, is this something we can put in the work plan? I know we just did our strategic priorities exercise and our work plan exercise, and part of our, our priorities is to do plaques. Um, and um, potentially, I can see that this is an opportunity similar to the Sobe Road sign, where we might have to actually revisit the wording of a plaque or a sign to make sure that it is still relevant and, and, and current to the uh, to the site. Do you see this as something that, uh, do we need a motion for it? Or can I ask that you guys can put a review of the plaque in your work plan? Um, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, that's definitely something uh, we can add into our work plan. And I just wanted to um, commend Pamela because that this is a sentiment that's being um, shared amongst heritage professionals in the field. And I really think it makes us front runners in this movement. So I'm really excited to see where that can bring our committee. Thanks. So I'm going to leave it with, um, thank you, Pamela, very much for your presentation and update on the information. Are you good with um, uh, Bianca adding it to the work plan? And, and it'll depend on the resources yes. of the staff. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. And, sorry, if I just can be of any help, I would love to be. Um, and, and Bianca, you know, Mary Jacks did the presentation to the, I think it was the Historical Society that I watched her actually present on the, uh, she was there at the site when Ken, Dr. Kenyon was doing the research. Um, and she did an excellent presentation to the Historical Society and a number of, uh, of articles that she has uh, written um, on um, the, the Grimsby uh, neutral site. So I think there's some great research there. Sorry, go ahead, Bianca. I was just going to add, Peter did recommend we just make a motion for that. Okay. Yes. But so, thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So thank you. So um, Peter, can we do a motion that just states that um, uh, Pamela's, uh, we've got one actually that says that the verbal update regarding the Indigenous history be received and that um, the review of the plaque be added to uh, the to staff's work plan. Does that make sense, Bianca? And Peter? Yes, that, that sounds good to me, uh, Chair. Thank you. I'm just going to say in the review of the plaque and that staff uh, review the wording of the plaque in consultation with Indigenous community, the Indigenous community, Pamela? Yes, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. And just to mention, I was also there um, when um, Walter Kenyon was doing the dig. Really? Uh, yes. Okay. Not to age myself, oh, but I was no. there. <laughs> I was a young child, we'll emphasize young. Um, <laughs> But many schools came out um, to see it. It's quite a significant piece of history. Great. Wow. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, Kate, did you have a question? I did. I had a question and a comment. Thank you through you, Councillor Brothel. Thank you, Pamela, for bringing that forward. Um, it, it leads me down a path of something I've been pondering in my mind about the exact same thing about um, about. Um, reconciliation and us having um, um, getting information and getting advice from the Indigenous community. Uh, something Bianca, and this is the question to, through you, Councillor Bothell, to, to Bianca or someone in the planning staff, it was just a curiosity. I, at one of the public meetings, it was brought up asking about um, at Fort Grimsby Beach. It was it was brought up um, asking um, about, about the Indigenous um, um, the consultation with the Indigenous um, community as per the RFP. And Bianca, you had said um, that you had had difficulty reaching, um, that you had reached out to the, the Indigenous community of Niagara, but you had, and it was just something that stayed in my mind and it, I've just been rolling it around, um, but you had had um, folks respond by wanting compensation for their, their, um, their input. And so, I was rolling this around in my mind and wondering if this is something that we budget for in our like in our um, council's budget. Like, do we like 
is as a part of reconciliation and being in such a historical community with such a presence of, of indigenous people, um, a history of indigenous people here, and as our efforts for reconc truth and reconciliation, is this something we budget for? And if you are faced with a situation where you were in Grimsby Beach, or at least it sounded like where they were saying, um, we'd like to be, we'd like to be, and rightly so, compensated for their time, um, do we have a budget set aside for that kind of, I mean, I know we do for getting peer reviews and having consultations through different, um, but I'm not sure if that's a standard thing that we have in place already on our budget to budget for. It's just a question that's been rolling around in my mind. Um, I'll, I'll answer uh, through uh, the chair. Um, so I have uh, reached out to all of the contacts from the Niagara region. Um, the typical response I get is that there's no actual like archeological dig that's taking place. A lot of the times they provide comments on um, the actual artifacts that are being found in archeological master plans. And then um, they are interested in the environmental reports. So because we don't have um, those particular documents associated with the study of a lot of the responses, we, we don't have any further comments. We've been getting a lot of that. Um, we have a policy within the secondary plan that speaks to um, the archeological and the proximity to Lake Ontario um, and us just reinforcing um, the provincial policy statement and the regional policies. And then the OP policies that are speaking to the archeology span making sure that that's noted. Um, we did receive one uh, question about uh, compensation and it uh, through the application was identified that it's more of a development application uh, compensation. Um, so we're just confirming um, with uh, legal due to the <clears throat> provincial policy statement if that compensation can be provided or if that is a precedent that needs council approval so um that's something we are still looking into but the general consensus is that they're fine with our proposed study and that uh, they have no further comments so we've only actually received one person um, asking about the compensation hope that answers the question just further to that, I, I, thank you for clarifying that. I'm just curious if we do, in fact, compensate Indigenous peoples for their, their, their advice and information, or maybe we don't have a long history of, of, of receiving that, info, that advice, as Pamela um, asked, you know, suggested that we should reach out to the Indigenous community and say, um, you know, can you give us your advice, can you spend your time looking at this, um, helping us, um, would we compensate for some of that, should we compensate for something like that as leaders? Um, I think that's a really fair question, and um, it's actually the responsibility of the region right now. So they manage all of our resources in that regard. So when it comes to an application, they have the matrix that shows where our resources are identified, I would say, uh, potential um, archaeological sites. And then through when they come to our different um, consultations, meetings, and things like that, they flag them. Typically, we flag them near historic sites because of the nature of the artifacts that are typically found on those sites. Um, but it is actually the responsibility of the region um, to enforce that review. So it's kind of a bigger discussion and something that we are looking at from a legal perspective and something we would have to bring forward to council. So Bianca, just on a yeah, simple yeah. level here, when we ask them for a comment on a plaque and the wording on a plaque and yeah. their relationship to to that location and and their and the sensitivity and and their input into how we should move forward with that, I think that's another thing Kate's asking is when we just ask them for input on a sign or street names or um, or this instant where they could review the plaque, um, you, you're going to go to the resources and there are a number of them that the region have. But if they should come back and say, well, we'll review the wording of your plaque with our with, you know, our different associations and groups, but it will cost you $100 an hour. Do we have the ability, like if that were the case or there was a request for compensation to do an assessment on that kind of a uh, an ask, do we have a budget and would that be something that we would be able to do? Um, so I'll just speak quickly to reference to Pamela's presentation. So the plaque in Centennial Park is a provincial plaque. Um, so 
they do approve all the text and they would do the associated um, consultation for that plaque. But if we did have a plaque um, made for the Indigenous history of that site, in addition, like say it was a Grimsby Remembers plaque or something like that, um, that's something we could report back to the committee and say, this is um, how much it is we want to ask to have Indigenous consultation be part of the budget. We could recommend it, but ultimately um, it would be the discretion of council. Thanks. Sorry, Ann, uh, Ann Brabant. Yeah, and I know that we have, um, the town of Grimsby has um, hired somebody to give some cultural advice through the, the museum and the library. Um, but, you know, I, I work for the school board, right? So we've had a lot of um, education recently on on these kind of issues and changing names and things like Iroquois are not terms that we use anymore. We use them actually by the name that they call them. They call themselves, and I'm not going to pronounce it right, but Haudenosaunee, and those are name, things, terms that we've got to start um, incorporating. And I would expect the province is on that as well, because there's there's plaques, there's names, there's schools, there's a million things that like terminology alone is has is going to be adjusted in the next few years. We're going to see some large changes and. Um, I think it's awesome that we're aware of it. It's awesome that we're preparing ourselves for it, but this is way broader than us just um, tweaking the odd thing here. It's going to, we're going to have to plan for broad changes. And if we don't have it in our budget, we should have it in our budget because it's going to cost some money. Thanks, Ann. And Tanetta, did you want to add to that? Yes, through you, Chair Both, will also say that we need to think of non-traditional forms of compensation. What we think of compensation is just money. When I've engaged with the Indigenous community, uh, a presentation of tobacco and other things are really the traditional way of actually acknowledging their contributions, and then you pair that with monetary converse, uh, compensation. So I don't want to simplify the conversation to something just about money. It's actually quite more, I think we need to respect their traditions. if we enter into the compensation type of piece and that's required. It's more than just financial. So we've opened a whole can of worms here, Bianca, because this is going to mean it's not just as, you know, we're going to review the sign language. Um, we've got, we had in one of our previous motions that we would look at Indigenous uh, naming for some street names. We've got a whole bunch of other, and, and Kate's brought up some things in Grimsby Beach. You brought up the archaeological issues and part of some of the input into our, our, our current land uh, land use planning documents. But um, Antonetta has brought in a whole bunch more things that as a council and not just as a heritage committee, we need to look at moving forward with our engagement. Um, and um, I think we don't have as council, we don't have a strategy for that type of indigenous engagement in place. And it, I don't know if, um, uh, um, you know, not just the compensation, but the consultation and that whole thing. There's um, the the call to action and stuff like so. There's so many different ways that we need to be more educated and in tune into what we need to do. How do we do that? How do we move forward from here? From this is a simple thing we're dealing with, but um, there's a much bigger picture as Antonetta says that the the committee and, and uh, the council has to be um, taking the lead role on. Sorry, Councillor Bothell, was there a specific question <laughs> you wanted to speak to? I, I just want to watch that what yeah. we hear today, yeah. <laughs> understanding that there's a bigger frame, like yeah, I this, there's a much bigger picture that has that that has to be considered mm -hmm. with respect to our whole um, engagement engagement with Indigenous peoples, whether it's through this type of a consultation request or through, um, uh, as Anne mentioned as well, there's going to be a lot more changes coming, and we don't have a strategy. But I don't think it's up to Heritage Committee to develop that. I think it's up to Council. So I'm just wondering if perhaps we can have you guys take back something um, that we. I think we need to bring in, uh, bring in informed Council that we need to work on an indigenous consultation strategy or engagement strategy of some kind. Does that make sense? 
I think it's a good discussion to have. Like I know from the recent Heritage Conference, it's very important now that we're inclusive of all types of history. That includes Indigenous. That includes many different other many other social groups. Um, so I think it's important to be front runners in that. And I know I've talked a little bit with Janet at the museum as well, and she's very much on board on promoting um, inclusive history. And I know as um, Anne had mentioned they did have someone on contract. Um, I did ask her a couple quick questions um, through Janet um, regarding the plaque and some things like that. And um, I don't know if we're fortunate enough to continue the contract with her. I'm not sure when it ends. I don't know if maybe it would be helpful to just ask her where to start. I mean, maybe commemorative plaques. I think we it's easy for us to think of things that exist like street signs and commemorative plaques, but maybe these things are not celebratory to their traditions. Maybe a plaque to them isn't how they would want their history commemorated. So I think it's a really big discussion and it's hard for us to make any kind of movement on that without, I think, starting with consultation and, and seeing where maybe you even need to do some research within the field and what other communities are doing to kind of have those conversations. But I think there's a lot of European traditions of street signs and things like that, that maybe they don't resonate with. So I think it's a, a big decision or a big discussion that needs to involve them at the, the very beginning. Okay. So this motion's become a lot bigger now. So what I, what I thought, and you can tell me what you think. So it's resolve the verbal update regarding Indigenous history received and that staff review the wording of the plaque in Centennial Park in consultation with the Indigenous community and that H that HGAC, Hayden Hamilton, our, our Heritage Grounds Advisory Committee recommends to council to consider developing an Indigenous engagement consultation strategy framework. And that, does that sound like it covers going back and, and putting the tasking on to that, uh, that, that then council can direct staff to work on an Indigenous engagement strategy or consultation that's going to incorporate some of these things that we've had discussion about this evening. I, I think you can recommend it, but perhaps this is something that could potentially, I don't know if it comes through the museum, I don't know which the most appropriate avenue is, if we have the resources to conduct something like that, but I'll pass it to Antonetta. And it's not that heritage staff take it on. It's going to council and council can an internet determine which how they want to proceed with that. What do you think? I just have, while I agree with that we need to do something, I'm concerned from a resource perspective and adding more priorities onto existing parties. So I don't know if it comes through our next set of council priorities or something of that nature, but I, I don't know. I don't want to speak for other staff where it may impact them and, and maybe report on the feasibility of some Indigenous strategy, perhaps. I, I would be weary to commit some of my, my colleagues to something I don't know that they have time for. So that's my hesitation with that. So it was recommended to council they consider, they consider developing right. um, an Indigenous engagement consultation strategy or framework. Um, it doesn't say when. It doesn't put a timeline on it. And, and it could be put into the budget. It could be put in as a prior council priority for the next term. It's, it's not, it's just recommending that council, considering it is a pressing need, we're, we're doing this piecemeal right now. We're just basically trying to do, you know, as things come up, deal with them when I think we need to have a more comprehensive strategy. Sarah, what are you thinking? Uh, thank you for that. This is an exciting, conversation to be having absolutely um, I think we also need to consider I understand if you know putting together this study of how we work with indigenous communities going forward might add you know workload onto staff but it is an important thing to do going forward I think for how many generations have indigenous people been silenced in so many different ways and I think um, just to say, oh, well, we're really busy right now. We're going to put it off to the side. I don't really think it's really fair to the idea of truth and reconciliation going forward. That's just my my comment on the situation. So what did you think about the wording? The, so the I, I, I would, I thank you. Um, I think we should recommend that instead of the feasibility aspect that we actually move forward with, with creating something. Okay. Um, um, Kate, did you have something else you wanted to add? Because I've kind of been putting you in the back burner there. 
sorry, through you, Councillor Bothell. No, no, nothing else. I, I just wanted to start. I just wanted to add Pamela's conversation, get what was in my head out about, about, um, I mean, it'd be great to have a plan. It'd be great to have a plan and great to do a study, but I mean, even moving forward when we have on a, on RFP for Grimsby beach saying that we're going to have consultation for, um, native uh, indigenous people and we in the street signs and they're just our last meeting we talked about having um having um consulting some indigenous communities and giving us some ideas for street signs i would just even at the bare minimum like to put a value on that because historically from a historic committee advising on history historically we haven't had a good uh, record of valuing their time and their assets and their contributions to our society and maybe even if we move forward by putting a number on that in our 2022 budget if we don't have time for a study at this point so, and, and I'm not asking, like, this Indigenous consultation framework is not actually a heritage. I'm not actually telling council that it has to come back to heritage to, to determine it, right? So, okay. right? No, and we're just, we're just coming back from, like, we're, I'm just saying that as a, because I'm coming at it from the Heritage Committee as, it's, it's part of our history. Um, and, um, and, 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 um, that's all, that's all. That's historically, it, it doesn't have to come back to us, but historically we don't have a good record and, and we are, we are all perched to have a better record moving forward. So how about we start now with gotcha. a budget number? Yep, thank you. And Pamela, go ahead. Thank you, Councillor Bothwell. Um, there's also the significance of the indigenous people during the war of 1812. Uh, there, there's so much history here that I, I think we need to speak more to um, re respecting heritage, uh, the, the heritage, the history of Indigenous people. And as I said before, I would be more than willing to um, put some of my time towards this. I would not have an issue with that as well. I'd be more than happy to do that. So... Thank you. So um, I've got the motion worded right now, resolved with the verbal update regarding Indigenous history received and that staff review the wording of the plaque in Centennial Park in consultation of Indigenous community and that Heritage Grimsby Advisory Committee recommends to Council to consider developing an Indigenous engagement consultation strategy framework. So um, can I have a mover and a seconder for that? I've got Anne and I've got Pamela. Um, any, everybody good with that? as it's worded. Um, can I ask everybody who's good with that to put their hand up? And that's carried, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela, for the bringing that forward. Uh, it opened up a, a really good discussion. And I think we've got some, uh, we've, we've got that momentum going, thank you. Um, the next uh, item on the agenda, and I'm, I appreciate everybody's patience. We're going on, uh, We've gone on a little more than three hours. Normally, we uh, we would have a break at this point. Is everyone okay to continue? We have just two or three little small items, and then we should be done. Okay, I'm, I appreciate your patience. The next item is the uh, verbal update on the work plan. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. This one's super quick. So I do have um, kind of a, a rough draft of the work plan based on all the comments. I just didn't have it ready for tonight. So I'm going to be circling in it circulating to hopefully next week, if not the week after. And then um, I will, I'm going to circulate it via email. And then if you guys have any comments, we can kind of get it in a good place to bring forward um, to the next meeting. And then we can uh, recommend that one be uh, approved. And I don't know if anyone has any comments on that one. No, I appreciate your work on that. Thank you. Um, is your hand still up there, um, Kate, from before? Okay. Um, so the last, uh, the, I'll get, thank you. I've got a motion here. I just need a mover and a secondary resolve that the verbal update regarding the staff committee work plan be received. If I can just have a mover and a seconder. I've got Pamela and I've got Sarah. Thank you. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. And then the next item is the, uh, if I can have a plaque up uh, event verbal update. 
Uh, thank you, Councilor Bothwell. Uh, so historically, we've used our December meeting for a committee social for the holiday season. While we continue to navigate through COVID, we would like to suggest that this social be our plaque event. Uh, we can hold the event in council chambers and st stagger all the plaque recipients and give the committee an opportunity to meet and thank our valued heritage homeowners. Uh, we have prepared a rec uh, invitation for the event. So we're hoping um, we can circulate that um, to the um, plaque recipients um, after tonight's discussion. Um, and I just wanted to note that all business matters will resume in January. Uh, we got um, a lot of business into this meeting in order to make um, that availability for our social. So we're hoping that our social could be used for the plaque event and um, we'll ensure it's a COVID friendly uh, event. So I'll leave it to the committee for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you guys can put that, pull that out of a hat for December 14th, Bianca? We do have the invitation ready. So if everyone's okay with that, we can circulate that and uh, see availability with all the recipients. Um, and uh, yeah, we're really excited to get them the plaques. We've also prepared uh, an instruction sheet to show them how to install them all. And we've used, you know, best practice and stuff for that. So again, whatever the committee uh, would like to, if they're okay with that, then we can put that in forward uh, in place starting tomorrow. That's Sorry, exciting. long day. <laughs> My I words know. are jumbling. I hear you. Anybody <laughs> else you. Have comments on that, uh, on uh, Bianca's update? Now that meeting is December 14th, right, Bianca? Uh, yes, it's the second Tuesday. It's nice because it's the 14th, so it gives us a two solid weeks um, to give the, the recipients, and then we can also get something out to them. So we are confident there's enough time for that. Okay. Um, Kate, did you have your hand up, or is that still up again? <laughs> Does anybody have any comments? Is everybody excited about December 14th? Like, is the cat excited, Sarah? I don't see the cat. Okay. Um, so I have a motion here resolved that the verbal update regarding the plaque event be received, which means that the December 14th meeting will be um, this wonderful plaque event, which I, I know that staff are going to be working very hard at, and it's been a long time coming. So it's going to be really, really exciting. We're going to really get pumped up. So can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Anne, moved, seconded by Sarah. All in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much for that, Bianca. That's that's really good news. I'm really glad to hear all the work you guys have done on that. Uh, and, and I know you're gonna cram it in just before Christmas, which is an, an, a lot on your plate too. Um, your status sheet, if we wanna just do that, that's the next item and the last on our agenda. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bothwell. So I did update the status sheet. Everything was highlighted in yellow. Um, as mentioned at the last meeting, I'm not gonna go through it all, just if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions on the status sheet? I know that um, it's getting late. Um, there might be a few developments I think I saw in there, Bianca, that just might be need a little bit more tweaking, but we can look at them again in more detail when we get into January. It's not, uh, I think some things have, have happened since the last one, but um, anybody have any comments? No, I don't see any comments. So I have a motion here. It's resolved the status sheet be received. I need a mover and a seconder. I've got Mark and I've got Kate. Everybody in favor of receiving the status sheet? It's carried. It's all great. And uh, we have anybody have new business? So, um, and again, usually it's just something relevant or quick. No, we're all good. I'm then I'm going to move to adjournment. Um, do I have to say all in favor of adjourning, Peter? Or can I just say the meeting's adjourned and we can all go to bed now? If the business is all concluded, you can just adjourn the meeting. I'm going to adjourn the meeting. And I love the Christmas tree, Pamela, in the background. And uh, we will be chatting with everybody on December 14th to, to have a bit of a celebration. And thank you, staff, for all your efforts tonight and everybody on the committee for putting up with a very long meeting and all of your very valuable input. It was very productive. Much appreciated. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night.